Well, thank you for coming. It's an honor to be here at Berkeley to speak on the creation side of things. My name is Ken Hovind. I taught high school science 15 years and now do seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Paul contacted about 160 professors to see if they would debate. Nobody would. So I'm just going to speak for about an hour and then to open up for question and answer time. And if you have questions, please write them down. We'll be ready for it. And uh, any questions are fair game if it's related to the creation topic, okay? Uh, preferably on the topic of creation and evolution. Now, I am not against science, okay? I'm not against rules. I'm just simply against lies. And tonight I'm going to share with you some of the lies that are found in your textbooks that are used consistently to support the evolution theory, okay? Uh, that's not my wife. It's just a picture of her. Uh, I have three kids, one of each. I have them all married off and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free. And two and a half grandkids. I have one more coming up here in a few days. Uh, and we produce a lot of materials on creation and evolution. None of our material is copyrighted. We encourage people to get them and copy them and give them to your friends and uh, get rid of them. I mean, for sake of uh, time here, there we go. The Bible tells us in the Ten Commandments pretty clearly, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie, okay? According to the Bible, anyway, it's wrong to lie. According to the evolution theory, I can't think of anything that could possibly be wrong because I've often asked people, if evolution is true, how do you tell right from wrong? Make me a list of ten things that are wrong, and before you make the list, tell me how you decide what goes on the list. Where is your standard to determine right from wrong, if evolution is true? Now, the Bible says very clearly, a false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall not escape. The Bible talks about people who delight in lies, Psalm 62. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a lying tongue, and false witness that speaketh lies. Okay. The Bible says, Jesus holds a vote, you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of, him, of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. I am convinced, after studying this topic for many, many years, there's an awful lot of good science in these science books. But there are some lies mixed with them. I'm not against the science, I'm against the lies, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Now, in my first few, three tapes of my seminar series, I tell how students are being lied to about the Big Bang, it didn't happen. They're being lied to about the age of the Earth, the Earth is not billions of years old. They're being lied to about the cavemen, there's never been a caveman, unless you mean Osama bin Laden. And they're being lied to about the dinosaurs, they did not live millions of years ago. Here, I typically spend three hours, I'm only going to spend one tonight, talking about some of the lies in the textbooks, 25 of them, there are probably 80 that need to be discussed. Disclaimer here, I'm not trying to get evolution out of the schools. I'm really not. I'm not trying to get creation into the schools. I just want the lies out of the books. That's, that's all. I'm sick and tired of paying for lies. Now, my mother retired from teaching public school. She's been in heaven for seven years now. My brother retires this year after 34 years of teaching public school. There are many good teachers in the system. Dan Woods was a high school principal for 11 years and a science teacher for six years. He and his wife are now on my staff at Dinosaur Adventure Land in Pensacola, Florida. There are many good teachers in the system. I agree. Is there anybody here that thinks teachers or textbooks should be allowed to deliberately lie to students for any reason? I think that'd be okay. All right. Wisconsin has a law that requires textbooks to be accurate. So does Alabama. Textbooks shall be adequate and current. Okay. Texas says instructional material shall be factual. Okay. <laughs> Florida has a law that requires accuracy of instructional material. So does California. California textbooks shall be factually accurate and incorporate principles of instruction reflective of current and confirmed research. Minnesota says a teacher shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. Those are all good laws. The problem is no states enforce them. Okay. Second Peter warned us. Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. See, the reason people scoff at the Bible is not because of their science, it's because of their sin. Julian Huxley, Thomas Huxley's grandson, said, I suppose the reason we leapt at the origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Ooh, well, at least he's honest. They just want freedom from God's authority over their life, and he admitted it, okay? Sir Arthur Keith, who wrote the foreword to Darwin's book when it was republished in 1759, uh, Keith said, Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. Well, Arthur, why would it be unthinkable to think there might be a creator? Well, Romans chapter 1 gives us the whole story. If you read the whole chapter, it's pretty interesting. It says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Romans 1 is a very interesting chapter, by the way. First, 2 Thessalonians.
Psalms tells us, for this cause God did send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And if you believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, you have been deluded, okay? You have believed a strong delusion. You're welcome to believe that. I don't, you can believe anything you want. I don't care what you believe. But I'm just telling you, you're deluded if you think your grandpa was a rock. Now, evolutionists cannot silence their critics with logic. That's why they won't debate. Okay, and I'll come back at my expense and debate all the professors here at the same time on three simple conditions. I get half the time. If there's 20 of them and one of me, that's fine. I get half the time. Number two, we talk about one topic at a time. Number three, anybody can videotape it and use the tapes. Simple. They can't, they can't stop us with logic, so they disrupt, distract, use legal pressure, or silence the messenger. Shut this guy up somehow. Here's an atheist forum just two days ago going around the internet. His supporters would be doing their best to pack the audience. You do the same. This is atheists talking to each other. Maybe, maybe Mike's in the crowd here. Um, this will make it more interesting, as Hogan is a master debater and can have a creationist audience in the palm of his hand, so to speak. Having an audience containing an element hostile to his propaganda will put him off his stride. Loud laughter every time he tells a whopper or just a collective audible intake of breath may have the desired effect on him. But a 50 caliber machine gun may not be quite the thing for this job. You want to leave the audience members intact if possible. Otherwise, you're going to create a lot of bad feeling on every side. Why spray all those bullets around, David said. Responding to the previous, why, they're all creationists anyway. I'm still going with the artillery shell, Lenny Flight said. Also responding, well, whatever does the job is fine with me. I just thought of using a large caliber. Well, let him leave the final stage with the real bang. After all, it will be the only honest thing he'll ever do on stage, no? But what worries me in this case is that uh, someone may decide this is the American solution to Hoven. For all that, uh, he is a slimy piece of intellectual crap. After This is, after all, an intellectual dispute. Threatening to harm him is not, proper, is not appropriate, nor le not legitimate, not good policy. Where do you stop? Shall we shoot door-to-door -door evangelists whose ideas we don't like? Jokes have this nasty tendency to turn into actions, John Wilkins writes. True enough, I was only thinking that the effect of a 50 caliber anti-personnel round could have on the human body at close range might scare even an audience of creationists into reconsidering their views. Too few of us have a really good appreciation for human inter internal anatomy, if you ask me. Let me show you something here. This is the same exact mentality the Catholic Church had toward people who disagreed with them just a few hundred years ago when they tortured people and tried to, tried to scare everybody else into accepting the Church's dogma. There are people who really honestly want to scare people into accepting the evolution dogma because they don't have any evidence to support it, okay? Now, the Bible tells us the, the scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. The scoffers are willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. <laughs> They're willingly ignorant of two things. Number one, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. They don't want to believe God created this place because then that means he owns it. That means there might be some rules. You know, like thou shalt not. <clears throat> they don't want those rules. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They're ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth. Also, the Bible says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. They don't want to admit there was a flood, because that flood indicates God has the authority to judge his creation. Now, I want to share with you some of the lies in the textbooks, and tell you what I think ought to be done about it, and then we're going to take time for questions and answers. One of the biggest lies in the textbooks started back in 1830, when they developed the geologic column. And they started telling everybody, each of the layers of rock that you see is a different age. The Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all this was invented out of the clear blue sky, most of the names come from England, Devonian, you know, from uh, Devonshire, and the uh, Cretaceous from Cretia for chalk, the chalk layers over there in England. Um, the uh, <clears throat> geologic column doesn't exist any place on Earth except the textbooks. Now, Charles Darwin didn't like the round numbers. He said that the Weldian deposits in England were 600, 306,662,400 years old. How he knows that is anybody's guess. But all over the world, these this petrified trees like this one are found standing up, connecting different rock layers. Here we've been teaching the kids for years, these layers are different ages, and yet thousands of these petrified trees have been found in the vertical position. Now, I taught earth science for a long time. I'm telling you folks, it's just not common sense to say the layers are different ages if you have a petrified tree standing up, connecting them all. Let me get my hyperlink to work here. Oh, there it is. 
There are thousands of these. I have a brochure you can get for $2. It contains 30 colored pictures of petrified trees standing up, running through many layers of strata. So if somebody tells you the layers are different ages, I say, I'm sorry, I just, I simply disagree. The way science is supposed to work, you get a theory, and then somebody says, hey, here's my evidence for the theory or against the theory. All right. There is ample evidence against the theory that the layers are different ages. This has been known for centuries that petrified trees exist in the vertical position, connecting layers that are supposedly millions of years different in age. So, I disagree when somebody says the, earth, the layers are different ages. Now, this is, though, what all of the evolution theory is based on. This geologic column simply does not exist. It's one of the lies in the textbooks. Now, 80 to 85 percent of our surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct consecutive order. It becomes an overall exercise of gargantuan special pleading and imagination for the evolutionary uniformitarian paradigm to maintain there ever were geologic periods. The whole thing is baloney. Even though this geologic column does not exist, that's what changed people's worldview back in the early 1800s. People began to doubt the creation view of history, because that's what was commonly taught in the early 1800s, and they began to believe the Earth is millions of years old. This teaching of the geologic column especially affected a young theology major who just graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. His name was Charles Darwin. Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a pastor at the church, in the Church of England. He sailed around on board the Beagle for five years, and he collected bugs. While he was sailing around, he brought some books with him to read. He brought Charles Lyell's book that talked about the geologic column, and that's the book that destroyed his faith. It changed his life forever. Darwin later wrote to his friend and said, This belief crept over me on a very slow rate, but at last complete, I felt no distress. He slowly lost his faith in the Bible. As Darwin sailed around the world, he came to these islands called the Galapagos Islands. There he noticed there were 14 varieties of finches. He shot many, many birds. Darwin shot an awful lot of birds. He didn't like birds because he liked worms. He thought it was kind of mean for the bird to eat the worms. So he shot a lot of birds and stuffed them and collected them. He had a huge collection of stuffed birds. And the ultimate, ultimate environmentalist of his day. Um, Darwin looked at all these birds and said, you know what, I think these 14 varieties of finches had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie, it was a bird. <laughs> well, the grants went over there and studied them for 20 years, and they found out during wet years and dry years, the beaks get thicker during dry years and thinner during wet years. By, notice this, by one-tenth of one millimeter. One-tenth of a millimeter difference in average beak thickness from wet years to dry years. Okay, that's the evidence that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Darwin then wrote in his book, after studying these birds and other things around the world, he said, you know, maybe these 14 kinds of birds had a common ancestor, and that proves that birds are related to bananas. You say, oh, he didn't say that. He certainly did. Page 170, it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Just because you see 14 kinds of birds, that doesn't prove birds and bananas are related, for heaven's sake, okay? Charlie observed what is sometimes called microevolution. I object to the term, I don't think they should use it, but they do, so I'm going to explain it, okay? Microevolution tells us you can see a variety in the dog kind. Dogs produce a whole variety of offspring. This is observable, it is scientific, it is scriptural, it's, it's just a plain fact, okay? It happens. Nobody with half a brain would question that. The question is, does it go any farther than that? You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you will get a dog every single time. And it could very well be that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. Nobody would argue with that, even though there are three totally separate species. I have five-year-olds do this all the time in the audience. I say, okay, kid, here's a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> Just about without exception, they can figure it out. Okay, it's the banana. Um, National Geographic says, the evolution of dogs, yes, wolf to wolf. Nobody is arguing with that, but that's not really evolution. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind. So the question is, can they bring forth? And the dog and the wolf can mate and bring forth. They're the same kind. The dog and the banana cannot. They are not the same kind, okay? This word evolution has six meanings, and if you're going to discuss evolution, it's extremely important you discuss exactly, define what you're talking about. The first meaning of the word is cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. Before you can have a coherent theory of evolution, you have to have something that explains where did time, space, and matter come from. They all exist. They seem to be a continuum. You can't have one without the other. If you had matter but no space, where would you put it? 
If you had matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You have to have time, space, matter simultaneously. The Bible explains that in ten words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth. Matter. Ten words. I, I have to just simply take by faith, God did this. The evolutionist believes they just happened. They have the exact same problem that creationists have. See, that's why I say both creation and evolution are religious. You have to believe in this one. Secondly, we have what's called chemical evolution. I've never had an evolutionist discuss this one or even address the topic. But if the Big Bang Theory says, well, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and maybe some helium, how did we get all these other elements? You want me to believe that uranium evolved from hydrogen? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it happens in fusion in stars. You can't fuse past iron. And even if you could, you still got a serious chicken and an egg problem. Which came first, the stars to make the elements, or the elements to make the stars? You've got a real serious chicken and egg problem here. Thirdly, the plus, plus it's not observed. It's purely theoretical. They can believe that if they want, which is my point. This is a religion that it happened. It's not science. Thirdly, we'd have to have stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. We never see stars uh, forming. We see a few spots getting brighter, and they right away say, oh, wow, star forming. Oh, duh. Freshman law student could tear that one apart. You see a spot getting brighter. It could be dust is flaring in front of a star already existing. It could be a supernova getting ready to happen. The stars do blow up, you know, and they get brighter before that happens. We've, and there are all kinds of laws, like Boyle's gas law, that would prevent a star from forming from a dust cloud. There's no scientific physical evidence of how this can happen, but they have to have it happen. After all, there's enough stars out there that we know about that everybody on Earth can own about 11 trillion of them to yourself. That's the current estimate as of last year. So how do the stars all get there? Fourthly, there's going to have to be organic evolution. Somehow life has to start from non-living material. That the evolutionist is still stuck, stuck 200 years behind the time, believing in what's called spontaneous generation. They may give it a fancier name now, but it's still the same thing, life from non-living material. How did it happen? You can believe anything you want to believe, but I want to see scientific evidence. One guy said, well, what if scientists produce life in the laboratory someday? I said, well, they're nowhere close, first of all. And if a bunch of intelligent scientists get together and produce life, then that would prove it takes intelligence to make life, which is what I've been saying all along. It would prove creation, not evolution. Fifthly, we have what's called macroevolution. This is where an animal changes from one kind into another. Nobody's ever seen that. Lastly, we have what's called microevolution. And again, I object to the term, but they use it. So this one happens. The first five are purely religious. And if you want to believe those, that's fine. Honestly, I don't care what you believe. But don't call it science. And don't make me pay to teach that to the next generation of kids like that's part of science because it's not. But the textbooks are constantly changing the meaning of the word. They say evolution has changed over time. I agree. I have. Now watch this. In other words, living things have changed over time. Whoa, wait, wait, now hold on a minute. Are you going to skip over the first four? Are we just going to assume that these happen because, you know, this is a major serious jump in their theory. They don't have a coherent theory back to a beginning. Then they say, evolution is a change in species over time. Well, now they're right down to what I believe in. I believe species can have lots of varieties within that kind, but that's not really evolution. That's a lie. They're wanting you to believe all six parts to that theory by only giving you evidence for number six. People say, well, couldn't mi macroevolution just be micro over longer periods of time? No. The central question of the Chicago conference was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomenon of macroevolution. The answer can be given as a clear no. It's not going to happen, okay? Variations certainly happen, but they're limited. The farmers have been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time, but they'll never get a pig as big as Texas. There's a limit in there someplace, okay? Roaches become resistant to pesticides, but they will never become resistant to a sledgehammer. There's a limit, okay? People say, don't bacteria become resistant to drugs? Well, uh, just hold on a minute. Dr. Spetner points out this based on a misunderstanding. The mutations that cause antibiotic resistance still involve information loss. For example, to destroy bacterium, the antibiotic streptomycin attaches to a part of the bacterial cell called ribosomes. Mutations sometimes cause a structural deformity in ribosomes. Since the antibiotic cannot connect with the misshapen ribosome, the bacterium is resistant. But even though the mutant turns out to be beneficial for the moment, the mutation, it still constitutes a loss of genetic information, not a gain. No evolution has taken place. The bacteria are not stronger. In fact, under normal conditions with no antibiotic present, they are weaker than their non-mutated peasants. It's like if somebody's going through the countryside handcuffing everybody and hauling them off to prison and going to kill them. But you don't have any arms. So they can't handcuff you. So you survive. 
Oh wow, beneficial mutation. Well, duh, it might be beneficial for the moment, but you get back in the population with the working folks, and you're going to be at a disadvantage. So don't tell me this bacteria becoming resistant to drugs is an example of a process that's going to turn a rock to a human over 4.6 billion years. You're dreaming, okay? You're in la-la land, okay? Mutations always produce the same kind of plant or animal. That's not real evolution. The information for the variety has to already be in the gene pool. No new information is ever added. The gene pool of the new variety, like the Chihuahua, is actually more limited than before. What they've done with, with dogs, they select a certain slice of the gene pool to survive, you know, big dogs or little dogs. That's not evolution. It's selecting pre-existing information. That's all it's doing. And how long were the Chihuahuas last in the real world? <laughs> Turn them all loose into the woods and watch what happens. Yep, go ahead, make my day. Right. Um, genetic information is lost when you get a variety, it's not added. Real evolution would require an increase in genetic complexity. I believe it was Richard Dawkins who was asked the question, I got the videotape of it. Uh, he's, he was asked the question, can you think of an uh, example of a mutation that increases genetic complexity? He was totally silent for 19 seconds. Finally, he said, shut the tape off, please. He couldn't think of one. There aren't any. There are no mutations that increase genetic complexity. You might shuffle genes around, but you're not adding new genetic material. I grew up in Illinois, corn country. They've got a lot of different kinds of corn there. But I'll tell you what, folks, you can crossbreed your corn from now until the cows come home. You'll never get a hamster or a whale or a tomato to grow on your corn stalk, okay? There are a variety of dogs. Nobody questions that. But they're still a dog. And this Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. Oh, come on, don't give it a fancy name. It's still a dog. It's a dog kind, and it's obvious to a five-year-old it's a dog kind. This Mexican textbook says, oh yeah, horses and zebras evolve from a common ancestor. That's not evolution. It's still a horse, okay? And there are little bitty horses and big horses today. We had the world's smallest horse visit our dinosaur adventure land. Talk about useless. <laughs> Can't ride it. Well, my granddaughter wrote it, but... <laughs> See, horses, zebras, and asses can all be crossbred, and they get zorses, zonkeys, zeonies, zedonks, and zebras. Well, that's because the horse, the zebra, and the ass, are, and the pony are all the same kind of animal. And anybody with even part of a brain ought to figure that one out. Here's a herd of zebroids running around. Now, in the last 100 years, the Kentucky Derby has gone from an average winning speed of 127 seconds to 123 seconds. Now, even in the old days, they had some pretty low times turned in, turned in. How much money would you guess has been spent on selective breeding trying to win the Kentucky Derby? Like millions and millions of dollars, am I right? I don't know if they reached the limit for horse speed or not. I don't know. But I suspect they're getting fairly close to the limit. If you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, why don't you breed wings on your horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? My whole point is, sure, variations happen, but there are limits to the variations. Why the evolutionists can't see that, I don't know. They want to think there's enough variety available that a rock can turn into a human over 4.6 billion years. There's a variety of cows. They might have had a common ancestor. A cow. There's a variety of chickens. This is a magazine where you order chickens. What kind do you want to get? You want to get red rocks, white rocks, cherry acres, brown leghorns, golden comets? But the magazine says, the jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? It was a chicken. There are eight kinds of bears in the world. They might have had a common ancestor. I don't know. But they're still a bear. And it's obviously recognizable as a bear. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage all have a common ancestor. A plant. That's not proof we came from a rock. Here in California, they graft English walnut trees on the black walnut stumps. They do these by the, by the millions all over the place. Well, that's because the English walnut tastes better and it's easier to crack, but the root system rots easy. And with the hard pan out here, they get a lot of water stays in the soil. The black walnut system is much better root system, but the nuts are hard to crack and they don't taste as good, so they graft them together. Well, you can graft them together because they are the same kind, okay? You can never graft an English walnut tree onto the back of a turtle. See, that, that's the point that I don't know why evolutionists can't get that. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. That's all we have ever observed. Now, if somebody wants to believe, capital B, believe something was different long ago and far away, okay, you believe what you want, but it's no longer science. There's no scientific evidence to support evolution except known lies, okay? 
If real evidence exists, I would like to see it. But I'm sick and tired of paying for lies to be taught. Suppose I had a theory that the moon is made of green cheese. That's a dumb theory, but it's, there's no law against having dumb theories. It's a good thing, right? Then suppose I said NASA proved it when they went there in 1973 on a secret mission and drilled a hole and found the moon is made of green cheese. Well, see, now we got a problem. I have a dumb theory, which is fine, but I'm using lies to support my theory. Oh, now that's not fine. And until it's worse. Obviously, anybody can have a theory that they want, but it's wrong to, but to, use, to lie about my evidence to get people to believe me. And it's worse to get paid by tax dollars while I lie to support my theory. So if you have some evidence for evolution, I want to see it. I really do. But I'm going to show you some things in your books that are just plain lies, and I want those taken out of the books. Then if you end up not having any evidence for your theory, well, I'm sorry, get a new theory. That's the way science works, okay? You get a theory, you give evidence for it. If you don't have any evidence, you throw it away and get a new theory. It would work that way, and it does work that way in everything except when it comes to evolution. They don't want to throw that theory out because that's the only way they can get rid of God. They say, we've got evidence from fossils. This is silly. Anybody with half a brain can tell you absolutely no fossils could possibly count as evidence for evolution. No fossils count. In a court of law, they'd laugh at you. You bring some bones in. Hey, Your Honor, these ancestors are the, you know, these bones are the ancestors of everybody today. Well, duh. You don't know those bones are the ancestors of anybody. You can't prove those bones had any kids. <laughs> and you sure can't prove they had different kids. Now, if you want to believe those are the ancestors of somebody, okay, now, now you're off to religion, not science. And you ought to keep your religion at home. Don't bring it in school at taxpayer expense. <coughs> Evolution is dead. Some followers have a hard time letting it go, and they're actually willing to lie to you to make you think everything's fine. Oh, yeah, he never looked better. Pulse and heart rate look good. Yeah, he looks fine, folks. Mm. No, it's a dead theory, okay? There's no evidence for it. Okay. Textbooks say, well, the fruit flies evidence for evolution. They put those flies in the laboratory and nuked them and microwaved them and x-rayed them and did all kinds of neat things to the flies, and they got some really weird mutations. They got flies with curled wings. They fly around, couldn't go anywhere. Flies with no wings. It's not a fly, it's a crawl. <laughs> they said, boys and girls, fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies under any circumstances yet devised. Good observation. So all mutations observed produce flies that were inferior to the original fly. Good observation. But the conclusion they come to then is, fruit flies must have evolved as far as they can go. Uh, well, duh. There's another conclusion, you know. Maybe fruit flies are doing fine until you guys got a hold of them in your laboratory. Hmm? Maybe God made them right to begin with. Is that even something you could consider as an option? This guy said, flies in the north have wings 4% larger than flies in the south, and that proves evolution. Darwin is as fit as ever. An adaptation at breathtaking speed. Wow, wings 4% larger. That's the evidence? Are they desperate or dumb or blind or what's the problem here? Then they tell the kids, we're going to learn to think critically. Boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? What kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> wow, now let me think. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, I'm still doing it. Hey, did you know it is possible for the question to already have a built-in assumption? The question already has an assumption built in. That's not a fair question. And it's certainly not a question to learn to think critically. That's a Soviet-style indoctrination-type question. I would answer this and say, teacher, this question is poorly written. It assumes evolution has happened when it has not. It's like asking the question, why are elephants orange? Well, that's a tough question. Why are they orange anyway? They're not orange. And when they say, do you think humans are still evolving? In other words, you have to believe in evolution to even answer the question. So some kid's going to do this for homework tonight and get it counted wrong next time they meet for class because he, he, he doesn't believe evolution even happened. Then they say, how might the dinosaurs' body heat problems have led to their extinction? They've got two assumptions in that one. How do you know they have body heat problems and how do you know they're extinct? You can't prove the extinction of anything. Well, unless you're all places at all times at the same time. Watch video number three about dinosaurs. They say, we've got evidence from homologous structures. Oh, what is that? Well, they'll say, boys and girls, you have two bones in your wrist, the radius and the ulna. Yep, I see that. And the alligator has two bones in his wrist. And look at this. They're called the radius and the ulna. See that, boys and girls? That proves we are related to an alligator. That's what they're telling them. These homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. 
A seal's flipper and a human arm have very different functions. I agree. What evidence might help show that both structures evolved from a forelimb of a common ancestor? This is thinking critically? A uh, duh. Maybe they have similar structures because they, have, because they have a common designer. Is that even considerable as an option? They say, well, we're going to take a course on comparative anatomy. The bird, the horse, and the human have similar forelimb structures. Yes, boys and girls, comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. <coughs> The commonalities suggest these animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. This is a lie. They probably have a common designer. The forelimb of animals is amazingly complex. If you could get a machine to do what your arm does, you'd be a wealthy person. The human arm and forelimb and wrist are incredibly complex. But textbooks all over the world, I was in Germany last week, same thing. They teach the kids, this is evidence for evolution. No, they develop from different genes in the chromosomes. Evolutionists can't explain this and seldom discuss it. Why are these homologous structures coming from different genes? They'll say, oh, it's convergent evolution. Well, then you make another story. It's not science. We're going to observe that, okay? Similar design might prove the same designer made them. The lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy. You can go try it. They will. <coughs> that proves they both evolved from a Honda 14 million years ago. <laughs> See, it's an example of getting good observation and coming to the wrong conclusion. It's true many animals have a similar forelimb structure. I agree. They'll say, this, they must have had a common ancestor. Oh, now I disagree. I didn't prove that at all. This helps prove we all came from a rock. Oh, now you're really going off your rocker on that one. They say, we've got evidence from development. Yes, boys and girls, the similarity between the early stages in development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. Ernst Haeckel, who made up this whole stupid idea, called it the biogenetic law. He said, yes, as the babies develop inside the mother, they go through the stages of evolution again. Fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. Just memorize the word farm, and you got it. It's called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This thing was only proven wrong in 1875. Okay? The evolutionary idea the sick mind Freud relied on most heavily in the manuscript is the maxim that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That is, the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. This is what was taught in 1869, started by a guy named Ernst Haeckel. This textbook says, boys and girls, the presence of these fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. It's as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins and starts to copy them during its development. These structures persist in adult fish. They say the embryo of a human has gills like a fish? Oh, you gotta be kidding. This is a lie proven wrong in 1875. It's not true. Those little folds of skin in the embryo develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. Go study your anatomy. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen people that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one, okay? <laughs> Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's Origin of Species in 1860, the year it got translated to German. Haeckel wanted to find some evidence for evolution. He liked the theory, a lot of people do, because it you know, gets rid of God. So Haeckel said, we've got to find a way to get some evidence for this theory. Nine years later, there still was no evidence. So Ernst Haeckel decided to help out. He was an embryology professor at the University of Jena. He had access to drawings of embryos of all kinds of different animals. That's what he taught. So he faked his drawings. He took a human and dog embryo and changed them and made them look alike. He made fake drawings of these embryos from all different animals. Here is a chart that Hegel used. He traveled all over Germany and just about single-handedly converted the Germans to believing in evolution with his fake drawings. Now, here's the top. On the top is Hegel's drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of those creatures. I guarantee, Paul, are they still teaching the embryology at Berkeley here as evidence for evolution? I don't know. Does anyone have a biology textbook? Anybody have a biology I textbook? Look up a couple of biology textbook? I'll give it back. <laughs> See if they're still teaching that. Okay? Well, two years ago they were. Right? Two years ago they were. In the, the standard text. In the standard text here at Berkeley, embryology is evidence for evolution. They don't do it. They don't teach that. It's wonderful. Hinkle was tried by his own university. Six professors held a trial. He confessed and said, well, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. Everybody else lies, so I can lie too. This biogenetic law 
has become so deeply rooted in biological thought it cannot be weeded out in spite of its having demonstrated to be wrong. The biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail. Um, Richardson at St. George's Medical Hospital in London said, uh, Hegel confessed drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena, but the drawings persist. That's the real mystery. They still keep teaching this. 1998, Pensacola, Florida, University of West Florida was still using Hegel's exact chart. The exact chart Hegel drew is still used in the textbooks 125 years after it was proven wrong. There's, Darwin wrote his book in 1859. Hegel faked the drawings in 1869. It was proven wrong in 1875, but they still teach it in textbooks all over America. Now, if they're not teaching it here at Berkeley, yay, I'm proud of you. It's about time. But this is the type of thing I'm talking about. They're using lies to support their theory. I debated Kenneth Miller, who teaches at Brown University, Rhode Island, on the radio. I debated him for 30 minutes. He won't do it again. I said, Dr. Miller, why are you still teaching embryology as evidence for evolution in your textbook? You know that it was proven wrong 125 years ago. He said, yes, and we're going to take it out of the next edition. Oh, it's about time. Now, I know it takes a while for textbooks to get up to date, but I think 125 years is long enough. <laughs> but I checked his 2000 edition, and it was still in there. I don't know if it's in his 2004 edition or not, okay? But here's a 2000, or 1998 edition still using the embryology as evidence for evolution. This one says... Uh, they have common ancestry because the presence of gills and tails, okay? Here's a 2000 textbook teaching biology uh, is uh, evidence for evolution from fish-like structures, okay? Here's a 2001 junior high textbook saying the similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor because of the tiny gill slits. Here's another 2001 whole biology textbook saying they have gill slits, proof for evolution. Another one, 2001, another page says the gills of fish is evidence of evolution here. This is a college textbook used in uh, <coughs> Rutgers University. It says, similarly, because humans and fish embryo resemble each other, because humans and fish share a common ancestry. They have tail and gill pouches. Hmm, interesting. 2004, this year, Hope Biology textbook, says the evolutionary history of organisms is seen in the development of embryos. Folks, this is a lie. Now listen, if you have evidence for evolution, I would like to see it. Honestly, but I'm sick and tired of them teaching lies to support their theory. Where's the real evidence? Here's a 2004 biology textbook saying they have these shows these organisms must have a common ancestor. What? Similar foreleg structure and gills? Evidence from anatomy? Evidence from embryology? Look, if you got evidence, show it to me, okay? But don't lie to me. This textbook says we have a five to six week human embryo. Then it says by seven months, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby, but it's not. It's not a baby at seven months. Hello? It's a human at conception. 34% of babies born at five and a half months will survive. There's a 21-week-old baby in development where holding a doctor's finger while he did surgery on the baby before it was born. The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. <laughs> no, I believe he said you were with child. Did he? Yeah. Let's see. Scott Peterson is accused of murdering his wife and unborn child. Well, Paula, are you hypocrite? You're in favor of abortion, and yet when you want to get Scott Peterson for murder, you say it's an unborn child, don't you? Why do they keep this in the textbooks? That's the only way to justify abortion. There's no other scientific evidence to say, well, it's not a human. It's just a fish or an amphibian or a reptile. Why is it when you destroy an eagle's egg, you get a $10,000 fine? Is that obviously a baby eagle? Oh, no, it's just an egg. It's not an eagle yet. Well, <laughs> duh. This textbook says, uh, humans have an appendix that is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. That's a lie. You need your appendix. It's part of your immune system. That's been known for years. The appendix is one of the sites where immune system responses are initiated. Now, if you do have your appendix taken out, you can still live, I understand, okay? But you've got a much better chance of getting quite a few diseases. If you can live without both your arms and both your eyes and both your legs and both your ears also. It doesn't prove you don't need them. The arguments for saying, well, you don't need it, therefore it's proof for evolution, that's a stupid argument. Now, come on. Okay? That's losing something, not gaining something. This textbook says, the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. The National Center for Science Education, right here in Berkeley, California. Dr. Jeannie Scott is the president now. I don't know if she came tonight. She was invited. I want to take him to lunch today. Honestly, I'm a nice guy. I'm a 
We had a bunch. It was a good time. Okay, yeah. Andrew Carnegie left a bunch of money behind to start this organization to purposely to keep evolution in the schools and keep creationism out. Here's the homepage of the National Center for Science Education. It skips right back there. He works, he works there. You can verify this. Welcome to the homepage of the National Center for Science Education. We are a nonprofit tax exempt membership organization working to defend the teaching of evolution against sectarian attack. We are a nationally recognized clearinghouse for information and advice to keep evolution in the science classroom and scientific creationism out. That's why they exist. That's perfectly fine. If they're not using tax dollars to support this agenda. Here's a brochure put out by the National Center for Science Education in the storefront building right there in downtown Berkeley, a few blocks from here. They say, is this how the whales evolved from bossy to blowhole? Did a cow evolve to a whale? Oh, there's only a few differences between a cow and a whale, you know. The reference is now actually in Oakland. Oh, it's in Oakland now. Okay, I'll change it. Fix it for Oakland. Okay. Yeah. Whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. They have hind limb bones that have no function. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Well, these are the bones they're talking about right there. Just about all large whales have these bones in their abdomen. Just imagine the whale walking around. You know, I have tried to imagine it, and I just can't. Yep, here it is. The whale's pelvis is located far from the vertebra and has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. Folks, this is simply a lie. Those bones in the whale's abdomen are special bones that have special muscles attached to that allow the whales to reproduce. Whales are pretty big, you know. They just simply can't have more baby whales without a little assistance from these special bones and special muscles. Now, anybody that's telling you the whale's pelvis is evidence of evolution is either ignorant of whale anatomy or they're lying trying to support a theory. But it's not true. That page should be torn from the book. They say, these structures are considered vestigial. Yes. For example, hind limbs of whales are vestigial structures. This is a 2004 textbook. This author is ignorant of whale anatomy or lying to you. Probably just ignorant. Ignorance I can understand, OK? But fix it. There are no vestigial structures. And if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. That's the opposite of evolution. We can talk a long time about whales if you'd like. Bring that up during Q&A time. I'll talk about all that. Have you name your whale. I'm ready for it, okay? There's no evidence. And again, the fossil evidence wouldn't count at all. Okay, we got stuff on all of them. I have stuff, I have a 15 and a half foot python snake skin in my museum. If you look down at the south end of that snake, you will see it has two little claws attached to two little tiny bones going up inside the snake's body. The textbook says, boys and girls, these are rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. Reduced hind legs. There we go. This is simply a lie, okay? Those little claws are used in mating. The snake doesn't have any arms, okay? And he can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. This has nothing whatsoever to do with evolution. This again, somebody's ignorant of snake anatomy or they're lying to you trying to get you to believe a theory. Now, if you've got evidence for evolution, show me. But quit lying about this stuff, okay? This one says, humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. This is vestigial tailbone in humans. Vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. Organisms having vestigial structures probably share a common ancestry. This is a lie. There are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. And I've told people for years, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. Okay? Bend over. <laughs> They say, well, this baby's born with a tail. Look at that right there. That's not a tail, okay? There's no bone, no cartilage. It's not even lined up with the spine. It's a growth in the skin. It's simply fatty tissue. It's not a tail. Don't tell anybody it is, okay? This guy says, the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function. And it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the tail of a long, or long tail of a tree living ancestor. This is simply a lie, folks. A tail would be very handy to have, right? No. If there's evidence for evolution, I honestly would like to see it. I've been offering a quarter million dollars for evidence for evolution. Now, people will pick on the creation theory and say, well, how can you get those animals on the ark and blah, blah, blah. They can, you can pick all you want. But listen, I'm not asking for the creation theory to be taught at taxpayers' expense. They are asking for their religion to be taught at taxpayers' expense. So the burden of proof is on the evolutionist, not on the creationist. We don't have to prove our theory. If they, all the taxpayers start paying for it, then we'll have to prove our theory. Meanwhile, burden of proof's on you. So I'll take any questions. If you think there's some evidence for evolution, I would like to see it. We're going to have a short break here, give you a chance to go potty, get a drink. 
But if you have some evidence, honestly, I would like to see it. Okay? Uh, but this will all, it almost always degenerates into an ad hominem attack on me. And I'm not the issue, okay? Where's the evidence for evolution? Because that's the theory being taught at taxpayer expense, okay? Thank you. Um, my name is Josiah. I'm an astrophysics um, student. Um, my question is, can you give a scientific definition of a kind, not examples of what different kinds are, but as definition that can be applied universally? Uh, well, the Bible says if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. I don't know that I could define exactly where the kind border is in every place, but keep in mind, the question is a little off topic because the creationists are not asking for their view to be taught. The evolutionists are asking for their view to be taught. And I think it's obvious to anybody involved in any uh, genetic experiment or anybody breeding cows or corn, there are limits to the variations, which is what I brought out. So I don't think the burden of proof is on the creationists to necessarily prove what a kind is. However, put with keeping that in perspective, the burden of proof is on the evolutionists. Now, I think that since the Bible says if they can bring forth, that is, reproduce, they're the same kind. It could be that animals have diversified, like Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits, can no longer interbreed. Okay, but they're still obviously the same kind. They could originally interbreed. So in the, I will say the definition of a kind is those that in the original creation, 6,000 years ago, were able to cross to mate and bring forth. A ra rabbits can mate and bring forth, but they can't mate and bring forth with a dog or an elephant, or a whale, or a banana. I think in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it would be obvious to a five-year-old which animals are the same kind. There may be a few tough cases, understand? And that's a good place for biology to do research. But the fact that there are a few places the creationists may not be able to define does not prove we all came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago, to keep it in perspective. So, I guess the best answer I can give is the Bible says if they can bring forth of the same kind, if they originally were able to bring forth, okay? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Stephen Getz, and I'm an economics and history major. And I was interested in your response to this. Um, your main approach seems to be from a public policy perspective, insofar as you believe that uh, evolution is uh, given an unfair advantage in public schools and creations, and it's not. Oh, no, no, no. Let me take one part of this question at a time, so it'll be too convoluted. If it's a, as far as public policy, I'm just simply saying it ought to be not only public policy, but common sense. We shouldn't lie to kids for any reason. So, no, it's, it's not a matter of, I think, creationism is not giving a fair response. I think evolution is being, I think lies are being taught to support the evolution theory. So don't misconstrue my position. Okay? I, I accept that. Okay. Um, given that, I would also like to say that uh, science, as I was taught in school, tends to believe in theories, and insofar as I can explain that, I'd like to say this. Newtonian physics was believed by Sir Isaac Newton to be the explanation of the motion of bodies. At a later point, um, Einstein found that the theory to be better explained and explained why Newton was true. So science, you could say, has a series of theories which we teach a certain paradigm to students. And at a time when a theory becomes disproven, we therefore explain, okay, why were the elements of the previous theory correct? Now, I don't see why the theory of evolution being taught in schools is wrong, because if there was a possibility that the scientific method, for example, proves the theory of evolution is wrong, why would we not simply displace the okay. theory of evolution just as Newtonian physics was? Right, so let's take one part of the question at a time, because it'll get too convoluted, okay? I did not say that evolution should not be taught. I said lies should not be taught. My whole point was, the evidence for evolution is all lies. Stop teaching the lies. I never said evolution should not be taught. So you're, you're building what's called a false, uh, a false dichotomy here. It's not, it's not the, two, the choice there, okay? But how is it a lie? I know, I didn't say evolution's a lie. But I but said how the, is the evidence a lie? The evidence is I showed you tonight. The gill slits, the but everything Those are lies, them. those are theories. <laughs> like, I don't get what's, why you call it a lie. Like, I, I don't, I don't okay, see if, how it's a lie. The textbook teaches the kids that the embryo in the, growing inside the mother has gill slits, okay? That is not true. That is a lie. Stop teaching that. If they tell you the whale has a vestigial pelvis, it's not needed anymore, that is a lie. Stop teaching that. If they tell you the python snake has vestigial hind legs, it's proof for evolution, that's a lie. Stop teaching that. Now, if you end up with nothing left to support your theory, well, I'm sorry. Get a new theory. That's the way science works, okay? Okay, but I can still what lie at home in an attack, which you were saying that you don't prove of. No, I didn't say... Because lie implies intent. You're, you're misconstruing here. I did not say evolution should not be taught. I said they shouldn't use lies to support their theory. 
How many heard me say that? Making a value judgment about what a lie is. Making that value judgment puts you in a position of construing their intent. And by doing that, you make an ad hominem attack. Just logic. I said five or six times tonight, either this author is lying or he's ignorant about the truth on this. He's ignorant about whale anatomy. How many heard me say that? Okay. He's either ignorant or lying. Either way, it's not true. It ought to be taken out of the book. And your opinion is not true. My opinion is not true. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, my name is Adam. I'm a chemical biology major, but I don't want to ask you about that kind of stuff. I was just kind of curious. If, at the beginning of your presentation, uh, one of, one of your main points, I think, and I know you're saying that um, you're, you're not saying that evolution shouldn't be taught in schools and stuff like that, but you said one of the reasons why evolution is being taught is so that we can stop believing in God because we don't want any more rules. Okay, now, let me just take one part of this question at a time. Yes. I, I agree, that is my opinion, okay. that that's the reason people choose that theory. However, I did not at any time say tonight that evolution should not be taught. Right. I said they shouldn't use lies to support their theory, and we need to define what we're talking about. This word evolution has quite a few different levels or stages or phases, and I named the six that I classified them by. So the first five are purely religious, they are not scientific, and they, they should not be taught as part of science. Nor should lies be used to support a theory. Simple. So go ahead, one okay. second topic at a time. Okay, so I was just wondering like, if, if you would be in favor of um, any type of creationism, or specifically like Bible, uh, Christian Bible-related creationism. I mean, what if there are other sets of rules, but they don't happen to be the Christian Bible set of rules? Okay, is, you, is your question, am I in favor of the Christian set of rules or Bible being being taught in schools? Is that what you're implying? No, just that, no I, I'm not even really concerned about um, whether or not it should be taught in schools. I was just curious about your, your opinion on this matter. I, I, without question, believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. I believe the Bible is right in every respect. I believe that is the basis for a foundation for our moral system. That's the foundation for our country 225 years ago. But I'm not asking for that to be taught in the schools. Right. So the burden of proof is not on me. Right. No, I was just, I was just asking your opinion on that. Sure. No, I believe the Bible is true. And so I if, you, if, if you were to have a creationist uh, school, right, where, where it was taught, would it teach all kinds of creationism or simply Christian well, I don't think it's possible to edu to have any type of school without some kind of morals being introduced. Just teaching in general right. automatically implies morals. You can't say this is wrong or two plus two is four. Right. That's your opinion. Right. Okay. Uh, but I'm saying what if you have one moral system versus another moral system? Well, that's why the bigger question comes up. Should we have public schools, number one? Okay. If we should have them, okay. if we should even have them, then what should be taught? I mean, in a Muslim school, they're going to teach the kids one thing. In right. a Buddhist school, they're going to teach what they want taught. What if everybody went to private schools and everybody taught what they really? The whole, the whole it goes back much further than this. Who, who, is the, who has the responsibility to educate? It's the parents, not the state. Right. When you did, when you descend into a state-run um, institution, the state's going to imp impose their morals. Mm -hmm. And what we have here is a state, state institution imposing imposing their morals. So really, all the parents should educate their children, or if they want to get together in a collective school of Mennonites or Amish or Buddhists or Catholics, or then they can have their own school. But what's happening here is all of the taxpayers of all faiths are being required to pay for one religion to be taught, evolution. I'm against it. That's what's not fair about it. Anybody else feel the same way? Let me say this. If somebody wants to teach evolution in schools, they should do it in a privately funded school where the kids have to pay and come learn it, and they can teach whatever they want. <laughs> okay, and do you think, uh, this is just an additional question, uh, do you think that evolu the theory of evolution and having religious beliefs of any kind are completely mutually exclusive? I think that, that the, the biblical view of creation and evolution, depending on, you have to define evolution now. Are you talking about little microevolution, like I mentioned tonight, variations within the kind? Uh, I'm talking about to say like the, the kind that is taught in schools, as far as uh, the development of, um, you know, yeah, like what you were talking about earlier. Okay, as far as the development of, of life forms today from uh, different life forms, animals changing to a different kind, mm -hmm. where's the evidence for that? Who has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog or a cow yeah. produce a non-cow? Yeah, that, that, that's not what I meant. I, I wanted to know like whether you think evolution 
and a faith in Christianity can, can be, um, or whether they're necessarily mutually exclusive. Okay, I, again, I have to define what you mean by evolution, but right. I, I think that the, the first five kinds of evolution that I mentioned tonight are, are purely religious and are indeed contradictory to the, evo to the creation view. There's no evidence for evolution anyway, so why would we compromise a perfectly good Bible with a dumb theory that has no evidence to support it? Um, I, I would not accuse God of using a theory like that, of using a process like that. Okay, God did not use blind chance, misfits, and death, and suffering. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. I'll say that, okay? Right. But so, you have to presuppose a Christian God in order for that to happen. Correct, correct. I agree. Okay, so you're presupposing a belief in Christianity. Right. That is my belief, and, and if, if somebody wants to believe okay. that of these first five, they're welcome to believe them. However, they are not part of science. This right. is part of their religion, and that should be taught in private schools at private expense. I shouldn't have to pay for that to be taught like it's part of science. But right now, that is being taught as if it's part of science. So what is science? Then? The word science means knowledge. That's the single word definition of it. The more expanded definition is knowledge gained by observation, experimentation, and testing. You can look it up in any dictionary before, about 10 years ago, when they tried to change it. So knowledge is a way of knowing, you know. Uh, every dictionary for the last 200 years has listed science as knowledge and knowledge gained by observation, testing, and experimentation. We have no testing, we have no observation, we have no experiments to show us dogs can produce non-dogs or dogs came from non-dogs. Now, if somebody wants to believe that, they left science and went to religion, <coughs> which is fine, but do it in a private school. Okay? Thank you. Skip, I'm so glad you came tonight. I, I am too. I'm glad you're here too, Ken. Are you really? I see. <laughs> My name is Skip Evans. I major in anti-creationism at the University of the National Center for Science Education at Oakland, California. I, I, I honestly am glad that you, that you came, Ken. And what I'm actually really happy about is to see, to see so many science majors in the audience. Because you, you need to hear his message. You need to know what this man is talking about. Because when you go out and become university professors, you're going to call us up and say, some kid brought this book in written by a guy named Ken Hoven. What is this stuff? You're getting the lesson here tonight. So I really am. I, I, I think you should speak at a lot more universities and a lot less churches. <laughs> okay, now that being said, that being said, here's my question. What I have here is a little comic book I'm very familiar with called Big Daddy. Yes, sir. Distributed here tonight. Um, I understand that you helped rewrite it. I did. Jack okay. Chick Ch Ch wrote that originally. He called right. me and said, would you update this? It's 20 years old. Uh, yes. And what I'm looking at here is a diagram, a uh, very misrepresentative one, but let's ignore that uh, for the time being, of human evolution. And under Lucy, which was an Australopithecine, uh, I believe Afarensis, I think so. Afarensis. Afarensis. Very good. Okay. And there's this thing. <laughs> I got on my shirt. I cheated. Yeah, look at it. There's a statement here with a little asterisk that says, for details, watch part two of the creation seminar series by video by Dr. Ken Hoven. The caption underneath Lucy says, nearly all experts agree Lucy was just a three foot tall chimpanzee. Could you give us the names of the list of those experts who think Lucy was a chimpanzee? And I mean real experts. I don't mean John Woodmore, who's you know obviously a creationist. I don't mean Henry Morris. Hold on a minute now. Who are the experts that think Lucy is a chimpanzee? Did I just hear you say or imply strongly that if you believe in creation, you're no, no longer capable of being an expert? Is that what you imply? Who are the people who actually study Lucy, the paleontologists, who concluded that she was a chimpanzee? Okay, let's see. Let me tell you a little bit about Lucy here. Donald Johansson, Australopithecus afarensis, listed as evidence for evolution. About Dad, you're avoiding the question. Who are the experts that caught that say Lucy is a chimpanzee? No, I'm, I'm answering your question. Okay. I want to give you the history behind Lucy. I don't want the history. I want you to answer this question. Who are the experts, Ken? Or are you willing to say, okay, maybe we were wrong on this one and we need to go back and correct our little comic book? Let me finish the question. Okay. I'll answer it. Now, if you want to preach to a crowd, Skip, you've got to get your own crowd. See, atheists can't get a crowd like this together, okay? <laughs> Donald Johansson. Donald Johansson found Lucy. Actually, Ken, I would put it this way. You've got to be proud of atheists here, I think. Okay. <laughs> was sent to Africa specifically to find evidence for evolution. He found Lucy two weeks before his grant money ran out. It's a well-published fact. You're, you know, you're, you're wrong. You're right, right there. You're misrepresented. He Lucy goes to find evidence for evolution. He went to find evidence for hominids. 
the National Geographic labeled Lucy's knee, they labeled it Lucy's knee five times. It was not Lucy's knee. It's found a mile and a half away. Two you're wrong, away. and you're distorting the fact. That's not true. When Donald Johansson answered that question, he misunderstood what the question was. Somebody asked him, where did you find the knee? He found two knees. A complete knee was found with Lucy. He also found a second one a mile and a half away. Right. When he answered the question, he thought it was about the second knee, and that's why he said it. This is so documented. It's all over the web. You Skip. keep Skip. repeating the Skip. same stuff over and over again. You totally missed what I said. I said National Geographic labeled that as Lucy's knee, and it's not Lucy's knee. Was okay, it? so, no, it wasn't. Thank you, sir. Now, let me finish answering your question. <laughs> what, what did Charlie Johansson say? Did he find Lucy's knee? Did he find a knee with Lucy? Yes he may no? have, okay? If you find a bunch of... If you find it, well, if you find a bunch of bones in a pile in the dirt, you can't prove any of them came from Ken, the same mountain. Will you answer the question? I am. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't want Marvin Lubinow. No. An orangutan foot and a human foot are very different. Answer okay. the question, Ken. Okay. Charles Oxner studied Lucy with a computer multivariate analysis. He measured every bone, the length, the width, the height, the density, the circumference, and did a comparison. And he said, the various Australopithecines are indeed more different from both African apes and humans in most features than the latter are from each other. He said it's not a missing link. And his study has been rejected by all of the paleontologists who are qualified to answer it have rejected his study. Oh, wait, I've got one guy. Who are the others? One thing at a time. Nearly all experts. Who are the rest of them? One thing at a time. Uh, which is why I went, I'm glad to do a debate, but I want one topic at a time. Okay. Uh, what you said. You said. Uh, the question. You said. You said. Uh, Charles o is Charles Oxner uh, an evolutionist? He's not a paleontologist. So, did you imply by your last statement that anybody who doesn't think Lucy was a missing link is not qualified to talk about the subject? No. All I'm saying is I want you to answer the specific question. Nearly all experts. Who are these experts? You got one guy who's not a paleontologist. He's not a recognized. Uh, 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 he's not even recognized in the field. Who are these other experts, Ken? Is well, it, will, you, will you go ahead and correct us? Will is, you, it, is it possible for a person to be an expert in paleontology and not believe Lucy's I, I don't want to take up any more time, but I don't want anyone to miss it, that it was a basic, simple question on a claim that he published okay. that he has no answer okay. for. Okay, I have an answer. picture that everybody's missing here. We're going to lunch. Okay. Listen. Lucy consisted of bones found in the dirt. As I said earlier in my presentation this evening, no fossils count as evidence for evolution. You don't know they had any kids. You find a pile of bones in the dirt, it would be impossible for you to prove Lucy was the ancestor of anybody. You, all you know is you found bones in the dirt. You can't prove it had any kids whatsoever. And if you want to take that to a court of law and say, that's the ancestor of humans today, you're silly, okay? It's not that you can't prove it's the ancestor of anybody. That just shows the desperation. People are so desperate to believe their monkey, their grandpa was a monkey. Okay, well, you believe that if you want. But that's not common sense. So, Skip, I would take that into consideration. There may be, maybe it should not say most experts, maybe it should say some experts. I'll consider that, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Andy Greenstein. I'm a second year uh, NCB grad student here. Okay. Um, I think that your disbelief of evolution is really correlated very strongly to your uh, sort of lack of any concrete biochemical or genetic evidence. You've completely ignored the area of genetics and genomics. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. One topic at a time. Okay. Okay. Let, let's just take this slowly here. Right. You want to say, my rejection of evolution. I don't reject evolution. I, I accept microevolution. I think it's a lousy term. I think variations happen. Sometimes some pretty bizarre variations. Great Danes and Chihuahuas, if you want to call that evolution, I agree that happens. Now, I reject, I reject anything that's not scientific. We don't have any scientific evidence that a dog ever came from a non-dog. So you need to define what you mean by evolution. I don't reject evolution. How about your statement that genetic information is never introduced into the gene pool? Could you just make that statement again? I said there's no new increased genetic complexity. Do you know of any examples where a mutation 
or evolution has happened that has resulted in an increase in genetic complexity, which would create a new kind of animal. Give me your example. Yes, I do. There's a couple. Um, the first of all is a, a transposon. It's a genetic element that's mobile between species. They exist in corn, they exist in bacteria, and they often include functions like beta-lactamases. Beta-lactamases are new enzymes that bacteria never had, but are now introduced to break down penicillin. It's a new function. It's introduced by a mobile genetic element, and it adds a level of complexity. The second wait, 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 wait. It's introduced. How is it introduced? Um, the genetic element is actually mobile. It can be introduced either by um, phage transduction. These are small viruses that carry wait, wait, genetic wait. So this happens naturally? Naturally, yes. Okay. Does this, does this transmitting this new information by some natural means, as in like a virus, puts this new information into your gene code, is that passed on to the next generation? Um, in humans, yes, and in bacteria, yes, is it, and in corn, is it, yes. Is it beneficial? In the case of this example, yes, and in most cases, yes. Okay. Is it an example of something that's, is that, is that sufficient evidence for you to believe that a rock can turn to a human over the years? I never said that rocks could change into humans. If you want to ask, if you want to ask that question, wait in line, please, okay? Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that uh, I, I'm not trying to propose that rocks can become humans. I'm thinking about evolution in terms of, of organisms and living things. Okay, right? so, it's a, so what I'm saying that, is that complexity can be introduced into a gene pool by mobile genetic elements that I don't think you really understand. Oh, I do understand, but listen carefully. You understand transposons? No. You should name the three types of transposons. Just listen. You are yes. missing. You are missing the point. What I showed tonight in my presentation. Is well, evidence is, is not all the evidence. No, I showed there, there, are six, the there are six types of evolution. You're wanting to skip the first four. You're wanting to start with living things and say that these uh, DNA sections can be transferred. We'll start earlier. We'll start earlier. Right. Back all the way up. What, what, where do you want to start? <laughs> I want to let you know that transposable elements carry new complexity to species. They can do things like add new functions like beta-lactamases that confer a specific advantage. Further, these things can increase wait, wait, wait. complexity at the level of... Can you just finish this really quickly? Name an advantage. A beta-lactamases are an advantage because they break down penicillins, and they make these bacteria resistant to, to penicillins not only created by you and I in the lab, but by other um, penicillin-producing bacteria. Okay, did you see what I mentioned tonight about bacteria becoming resistant to drugs, especially penicillin? Right, but it was penicillin. incorrect. You said they never gain complexity or gain information. I'm saying they do. Okay, you're, 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 missing, you're missing such a big picture here, okay? Where did this genetic information come from? Oh, yes, you are. Okay. You're talking about taking already complex, incredibly complex genetic information and moving it. This does not, this does not at all help. How did the complexity get there? This is like taking a section of a program out of PowerPoint and it's somehow getting transposed into Microsoft Word. Okay, but they're both already complex programs. The DNA segments you're talking about moving around are incredibly complex. If complex they, to you. I mean, basically, <laughs> how, is how, is how chemically complex is DNA really? And how difficult is it to make DNA from simple elements like carbon dioxide, ammonia, add a little lightning, add a little salt, add a little uh, light energy. How long would it okay. take? They've done it in the lab, not long. You're it's telling me, now, I want you to repeat that slowly. You're telling me <laughs> that, that you take, DNA can be made very easily, you add a little something together, this add a little salt. This was an experiment that was done a long time ago where they simulated it. Oh, I, yeah, I know it was done a long time ago. Miller and Urey experiment, okay? Um, and it's been done many times since then. Let me show you what happened. Is this uh, the experiment you're talking about? Let's see. Uh, right here. Let's see. I'll get it. Okay. Oh, I'll get it. Yeah, okay. Right here. My mom did that. You're telling me you take a few gases and you run them through an electric spark and you're going to get the element. You think it's simple to make a DNA. That was your statement, I believe. I say it's not that complex a molecule in the grand scheme okay. of a the DNA, we've seen to exist in the universe. The DNA is not that complex of a molecule in the grand scheme of things. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, they use methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen in this experiment, purposely excluding oxygen. And I'll explain why. This textbook says he made he discovered the bottom of the flask had a red goo that was rich in amino acids. Hmm. Well, 
They didn't come close to making life. He excluded oxygen because he knew if there was any oxygen, it would oxidize whatever was created. The problem is, you can't get life to evolve with oxygen. Okay, it's going to oxidize. It's going to break it back down. Now, amino acids that try to combine are going to oxidize. The problem is, ozone is made from oxygen, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia, and that's one of the gases he used. So you can't get life to evolve without oxygen. Your chemistry is way off. What I want to get back to is the transpose bar. Don't, don't right? make an accusation like that. I want to get back to what I was talking about in the first place and stay on topic. I'm telling you that there are elements of DNA that add complexity. I'm telling you that small morphological or small genetic changes encoded by these transposons can result in large morphological changes and even um, um, differences as drastic as mating type preferences, you know? Okay, now let's, let's slow down, take this little bit of time. You're telling me that DNA can be moved from one type of animal to another through either viruses or mosquitoes or wherever you want to move it, okay? And this results in a new kind of animal that is going to be, that process is sufficient to explain how a simple thing like a, what we consider simple like a paramecium, can turn into a different kind of animal, like a whale or something else, over billions of years. This is, is totally you... hard for you to imagine because you don't understand it. And that's what I'm going to finish with. So. Wait, wait, wait. I, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine because I don't understand it. It's not an insult. I'm no, no. A lot of people don't no. understand it. I'm trying fine. to understand it. But see, you're missing, you're missing I, such I a big point. I else take over. Okay, this but is, you're missing such a big point. The point is, what you're referring to is something that is purely religious. You don't observe this. No, it's certainly observation. It's absolutely religious. Nobody observes any animal turn to a different kind of animal. Now, if you want Thank to believe, you okay. If you want to believe that, that's fine. But don't go science. Go ahead. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm a third-year integrative biology major. Okay. Uh, where to begin? <laughs> Just anywhere you like, Victor. Calm down. Take a drink. It'll be fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, so first of all, let's let's start from the beginning. You, you do not believe that uh, the Earth is billions of years old. I don't believe the Earth is billions of years old, but that's not what I covered tonight. I covered the evidence for evolution has all been all that's been presented so far is lies. Where's the evidence for evolution is what I was asking for tonight. Well, you were citing the, your belief that the Earth was not very old as evidence that evolution is not true, because evolution is based on the assumption. No, 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 I didn't cite that at all. You misunderstood, Victor. I never said the Earth is not billions of years old, therefore evolution is not true. What I said is all of the evidence used to support this theory of evolution has been proven wrong. Where's the real evidence? I do happen to believe the Earth is not billions of years old, but that is unrelated to the discussion. Even if it was billions of years old, that's no help for the evolutionist. That's only the first obstacle they have to overcome. Now, if you want to discuss the age of the Earth, we certainly can. But keep in mind, I am not asking for my belief to be taught at taxpayers' expense. They are. So, the burden of proof is on the evolutionist, not on me. But okay. go ahead. Okay, um, fair. But in order to explain evolution, you would have to believe that the Earth is billions of years old. Right, that's what I said. The first obstacle, you have to have billions of years to make this theory look okay. even consider reasonable. Right, I okay. agree. And, I we have, and we have very good proof that it is billions of years old. Okay, you're welcome to believe that. So, do you not believe in carbon dating and argon dating? Which one would you like to discuss? Carbon dating or argon dating? <laughs> or both, if you want. Okay. Well, I, I do uh, know a little bit about this. Let's see. Uh, Potassium slowly decays to argon. The theory goes that since potassium is found in rock quite a bit and decays to argon, argon's a gas which would escape into the atmosphere. So they say, well, when a volcano erupts, it should reset the clock to zero, and we should have any lava flows, when they're fresh, should reset the clock. And this is how they date things by what's called an event horizon. You can look at any textbook. I'll show you here. Um, Potassium decays at a pretty slow rate. 1.3 billion years is considered the half-life of potassium to argon, okay? Uh, about 80% of potassium in a small sample of iron can be removed by distilled water in four and a half hours. Uh, so, in conventional interpretation of potassium-argon age data, it's common to discard ages which are substantially too high or too low compared with the rest of the group or with other available data such as the geologic time scale. There's my point. It has to be based on ge geologic time scale. 
The KBS Tough for many years in all the science magazines was dated between 212 and 230 million years old based on potassium argon dating. Nobody argued with this. It was dated many, many times. Everybody said the KBS Tough is 200 some million years old. Until a problem came up, Richard Leakey discovered a human skull, KNMER 1470, under the KBS Tough. Well, now we got a problem. They knew it wasn't an intrusion. It wasn't a burial where somebody dug through the layer and buried it. They checked all that. They said, man, we got a, a pretty normal human skull under a layer of ash that's 212 million years old. We can't have that. It upsets the theory. So they redated the KBS stuff, even though it already been dated many times before. They never would have checked it had it not been for this fossil that was found. Now they got ages from 0.5 to 2.6 million years old. I would like to point out two things. That's way down from 212. Secondly, that's still a 500% error. Half, billion, half million to 2.6 million? Um, we can talk a long time about that one, but uh, the way they keep adding age to the Earth, okay? Uh, the Earth, if you want to believe it's billions of years old, that's fine, but I don't think you should use potassium argon dating to do that, okay? Hawaiian lava flow, 1801, a known eruption, was dated with potassium argon dating at 1.6 million years old. It didn't work. Okay, a Hawaiian lava flow, uh, let's see, in 1959, they knew when the lava erupted, it's supposed to reset the clock, it's supposed to make an event horizon. Well, how come it's eight and a half million years old? Sicily, Mount Etna erupted, I was climbing on Mount Etna two years ago, it erupted in uh, 1964, gave a potassium argon age of 700,000. The 1972 eruption gave an age of three and a half, 350,000. Brand new lava from Mount St. Helens was potassium argon dated, and it gave ages of 350,000 to 2.8 million from the same rock. This is brand new lava. So if you want to believe there are event horizons, you can believe that, okay? But rocks of known age, when you date it with potassium argon dating, it doesn't work, okay? If you date a rock of unknown age, it is assumed to work. This is silly. Now, the potassium argon dating for the KBS stuff is just one example. Here's how it's done. If you find a fossil underneath a layer of, of ash, it, the, the two layers of ash are called event horizons. Check your geology book, they'll tell you about this. And so the, the age of the fossil is bracketed by the two event horizons. I'm telling you, it's not accurate. This is not science. Somebody wants to believe that, that's fine. But see, one good experiment is worth a pound of theory any day. Okay, you can have all the theories you want about potassium decaying to argon slowly and the clock's being reset when the volcano erupts and leaves a layer of ash or lava. I understand the theory. In practice, it doesn't work. So, I don't want to hear about it. Go ahead. Okay, you don't want to hear about it. Well, I, I, I want to see some science. I, I can show you the scientific evidence says it doesn't work. When they test it, it doesn't work. Now, you, you can tell me all you want about it, but you know, and I'll listen to you. But if you want me to pay to teach that potassium argon dating works, I'm sorry, I object. It doesn't work. It's been proven over and over it doesn't work. Okay, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the sources that you're getting these things, so I will... Okay, now let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Would the source matter? If it was an evolutionist, would you believe it? And if it was a creationist, you wouldn't believe it? If the evidence is true, if it proves it, then I would believe whatever the proof shows. Okay, here we go. Um, here's the source right at the bottom of the screen. Uh, look it up for yourself. All right, I will. These are all right on my website, drdino.com. The same thing with carbon dating. You have similar problems. And I have all the sources listed. If you don't believe me, I'll show you here. 1949, when they first invented it, the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000. Living mollusk shells dated 2,300 years old in 1963. Science Magazine, Volume 141, check it out, okay? <coughs> and the, the 12th Nobel Symposium, they said if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. They pick the dates they want. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old, Antarctic Journal, Volume 6, September 71. Still not working, 71. Um, U.S. Geological Survey uh, paper, which I've got, people said that's not correct. I can talk about that if you like. Right? But they said uh, baby mammoth was part of it was 40,000, another part's 26,000. Same animal, getting two different dates. Anthropological Journal of Canada, 1981. 
They said no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of giving accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. And again, I think you're missing a much bigger point, okay? Even if the Earth were billions of years old, that doesn't help the evolution theory. All it does is hide it long ago and far away like a fairy tale. It doesn't, we don't see any evidence for it today. Dogs are still producing dogs, and that's all we've ever seen. Now, anything else is something you believe off in La La Land, okay? But it's not science. So the age of the Earth is only the first obstacle. I don't think it can be overcome. And it certainly can't be overcome with carbon dating or potassium argon dating. But um, that's, that's just the first obstacle. And I'm not, again, asking for my view to be taught. I'm asking for lies to be taken out of the books. Now, nobody yet tonight has come forward and defended any of the lies I shared tonight and said, that's not a lie, it's true. Is somebody to come forward and defend? Is it true the embryo has gill slits? Is it true the whale has a vestigial pelvis? I want to see the evidence for that, okay? Go ahead. Uh, may I defend uh, your uh, attacks on vestigial organs and... Sure. Uh, uh, also, related to that, uh, several times tonight you've um, cited as evidence against evolution that dogs do not produce non-dogs and... Um, Here, so wait, 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 one thing time. You want to talk about vestigial organs or dogs producing non-dogs? Um, well, I want to talk about both, but I okay. guess... Okay, we'll, we'll talk start about both. We just want the time. Okay, we'll start with, with, with uh, dogs then. Okay. Do you, uh, believe, do you believe dogs can produce a non-dog? Not, at, not uh, through one generation, no. Okay. So do you believe it's something that would require millions of years, and therefore it's not observable, so it's something you believe, not something you can show me? It's not part of science. Do you see my point? If you don't see that point, I can't help you. Okay. But you're not seeing... I, I, I feel that you don't really... You're, no, I, you're talking the uh, assumptions of evolution, but I don't feel you even understand the assumptions of evolution. No, I, I very much do understand. I understand so see, you're, that, okay. that you have to believe it happened. You believe it could happen if you had millions of years? Okay, you just left science and went to religion. Go ahead. Okay, but you said that dogs cannot produce non-dogs, but that is not what evolution says at all. Evolution okay. says you take two populations of dogs and exert and um, expose them to very, to very different selective pressures, then eventually microevolutionary traits will build up and okay, eventually yeah. But for the first see, couple thousand years, they will be able to interpret. Okay, so do you see how you right now are going from science to religion in the same sentence? Does anybody else see that? Am I the only one seeing this? Okay. You can believe that this could happen over millions of years, but that's no longer science. Science is what we can observe and test and study and demonstrate. I don't care what could happen over millions of years. What happens? We have 6,000 years of recorded human history with people telling us dogs produce dogs. What evidence do you have that would say that's not, that something other than that can happen? I don't, I don't, don't, don't tell me what might happen over millions of years. Where is the scientific evidence? Um, okay, put, put, another, put in another way. Um, do you believe that one apple plus two apples equals three apples? What does that have to do with dogs? Or uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so, you, you, you can, well, you can, you can imagine that. that, right? I want to stay on topic. Yeah, I believe one apple plus one apple equals two apples. I agree. Yeah, so do you believe that a million apples plus one apple will equal a million and one apples? Or a million plus two million apples will equal two million apples? If you're going to give me every possible example, we're going to be here for a long yeah. time. <laughs> well, you've never sat down and added. Yeah, I taught math. I believe that. Yeah. I understand. Okay. So, you know, you don't need to have seen personally millions of years of evolution to have to believe it. Oh, now you have a false analogy here. We have mathematical. Uh, uh, going, I've never seen a million apples plus one apple equal a million and one, okay? But that is not the same as saying, I've never seen a dog produce a non-dog. That is absolutely, two to to totally different things. That's a, a logical fallacy, okay? How's that a logical fallacy? We are talking about millions of uh, mutations and... Uh, okay, well, I don't think, I don't think I can help you on that one. Uh, if you, if you don't see the problem with that, that uh, then I think we probably should go to a different topic. Right? Okay. Okay. So, my, okay, uh, I guess I'm taking up a lot of time. One last... Oh, we just two questions. Uh, two uh, questions. I didn't get in line again, if uh, you want. Yeah, they get in line again. Yeah, Skip, come on back. I want to see you. So, so... Uh, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. You have another question about uh, vestigial structures? 
Uh, okay, yeah, so, so my last one. Um, uh, are you aware that uh, humans are not perfectly adapted to walking on two feet? Um, that is the reason why so many people experience lower back pain. Or, uh, wait, 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 no. Let me see if I understand this. You're saying humans are not perfectly adapted to walking on two feet, and that's why we have lower back pain. And are you implying that is evidence we used to walk on fours like an ape? Yes. Okay. Could it be there are there's our ancestors, we ourselves never did. Okay, there are an awful lot of people that do not experience lower back pain. Uh, there are cultures all over the world that don't have the lower back pain America does because maybe they have different dietary reasons or different exercise reasons, or maybe there's another reason for the lower back pain. If people have lower back pain, that would not be proof of an ape-like ancestor, and that would be the opposite of evolution. No, it would not be the opposite of evolution. Yes, it is. I, I would love to explain why it's not. Okay, where's an example of where we're gaining something new? We're gaining the ability to walk on two legs and thus have two appendages now, free to hold things. Who taught you that? And why did you believe it? I didn't teach you that. <laughs> no. I come here more often. I gotta come here more often. That's just what I need. Okay. I'll come here as often as you can find somebody to debate me, brother. You can call me, I'll come I'll drop it. You, you cite the imperfection of evolution as evidence against it, where in actuality it's okay. evidence for it. Okay, okay. First, okay. first I would say I don't think the human back is poorly designed for walking upright. I think it's designed just fine. Now, I walk around just fine. The um, if you're having trouble, you know, you can see a chiropractor or something. Now, the, but the example you're giving is a lousy example for evolution. When you consider that you and I, sitting, standing here today, are copies off of a copy, 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 I would say of Adam 6,000 years ago, and you would say off of a monkey 3 million years ago. Either way, there are many, many copies have been made in here. It's amazing we can even be having this conversation. The original DNA code must have been incredibly complex to survive all this long copying process. So if there are flaws in the human anatomy today, defects, okay, it's a result of, of thousands of years of genetic problems, of genetic load, of, of mutations that are degenerative, not helping. If there's a low back problem today, that's not helping, that's not evidence for the evolution theory. I don't know how you can't see that. Oh god, I could go on all night, but I maybe I'll be the next guy to take me on. Yeah, you can go on all you want. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Philip Hong. I'm a biology student through here. Oh, slow down. You're Philip and you're a what? Philip Hong. I'm a biology student. A biology student? Bioengineering. Bioengineering. So biology and engineering. Bi biology engineering student. Yes. Okay. Um, also through here. First of all, I'd like to say that it's, it's really been a pleasure being here with you. It's, uh, you're a really good speaker, first of all. Uh, okay. I think if I ever owned a business, I'd really like you to be one of my salesmen, first of all. I'll take it as a modified compliment, okay? <laughs> but, uh, uh, one thing I want to bring up is uh, the fact that you mentioned that we shouldn't be teaching bias in school, so my question is what would we be teaching if we wouldn't be teaching those? Okay. Uh, quote, quote, bias. If the things I brought up tonight were taken out of the books, there is still a huge amount of biology. I think most biologists, even evolutionary biologists, know an enormous amount of biology that they should be teaching to the next generation. Kids, these are the muscles, these are the bones, these are the tendons, these are the organs, this is the function, here's how the chemicals work. The origins subject is unrelated. It has, it, is, it has nothing to do. You could learn all the muscles, all the bones, all the uh, insertion points. You could learn any, a huge amount of biology without ever touching the origin subject. I don't think in public schools they should be allowed to discuss origins at all because you're going to upset somebody no matter what you do. The majority of Americans do not believe in evolution. So why is the minority view being taught and it's unrelated to biology? <laughs> So, if you took the lies out of the textbook, let's say if you took out 30 pages out of your book, okay? You still have a huge textbook and a lot of biology to learn. I am not against biology. I think the kids ought to know the names of the book. I taught biology and anatomy. I think the kids ought to learn those things. That's great. But origins and evolution has nothing to do with it. Why is this wasting class time when the kids ought to be learning? There isn't one doctor on planet Earth that cares about evolution when he's doing heart surgery on somebody. He needs to know his anatomy really well to do surgery. Evolution has nothing to do with anything practical in the medical field, except they might want to talk about bacterial resistance, and I pointed out it's a loss of information. 
So that, that would be a lousy example for evolution too. So if you want to do surgery on somebody, if you're going to be a surgeon, I would like you to really study biology, and I don't care what you know about evolution, it's unrelated. And many famous surgeons are Christians and creationists. The guy who invented the MRI is a creationist, okay? The guy who invented Gatorade, one of the world's experts on absorption of minerals into the body, is a creationist. So evolution has nothing to do with the subject of biology. It's unrelated. Well, this is a scary thought, though. Imagine that the lies that were being taught in school, that I consider that it might not be a lie, but in, in fact, it might be promoting other scientists to be, to be discovering things like cures for cancer, and, and so many other subjects and matters that can... Well, let's take one topic at a time. You're saying we should keep these lies in well, the textbooks? No, 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 no. I'm saying that these lies... You're calling them these lies, but you're saying there's, there's no point, absolutely no point, in keeping these so-called lies in the, in the textbooks. Why would you keep a lie in the book? Well, why would we keep natural selection, natural selection in the books? Then? Okay. Natural selection... I didn't cover that tonight, but natural selection certainly works. It has nothing to do with evolution. Natural selection selects. If I said, I want to get a population of 12 foot people on this planet, so I'm going to kill everybody under 12 feet tall. Okay, I have nobody to select from. I'm never going to get a population of 12 footers by killing everybody under 12 feet tall. There is nobody to select from. I probably could develop a population of 7 footers on planet Earth. If I killed everybody under 7 feet tall, within a few generations, I'd probably have a population of 7 footers. Because there are some 7 footers to select from. There aren't any 12 footers to select from. So natural selection is a selection process. It's not a creative force. And here's where the biologists absolutely go screwy in their thinking. They think natural selection is going to create something. Natural selection. This says natural selection causes evolution. That's a lie. It selects. Creationists have no argument with natural selection. We thought of it first. It's a conservative process that removes defective organisms. Natural selection may have a stabilizing effect, but it does not promote speciation. It is not a creative force. Science Magazine, Volume 217. Natural selection can only act on biological properties wait, that wait. already exist. It every, cannot create properties. It seems like every time someone has a question, you pull out a PowerPoint. When I don't have a PowerPoint to <laughs> talk from my point of view, and to be honest, I had it all well, first, so it's so just four sprites already, and my bladder's pretty weak, and I okay. can't sit through another PowerPoint. Slow down. Okay. <laughs> Presentation that supports evolution. No, and I'll that come back. Would be fair, right? and that would be for fair. you to, uh, to give me a PowerPoint selection and I mean PowerPoint presentation. And all okay. the that I'm I showing you right from people that you ought to respect. This uh, parasitology book. They said, hey, it doesn't work, folks. Okay, uh, that's true. This one here. Uh, this is Science Magazine. This is folks who believe in evolution. But they said natural selection will not promote speciation. It's right, not right, a creative right. force. I'm not. These aren't creationist resources. Okay. Um, but the fact Even if they were, though, it wouldn't matter. The fact is, if you believe natural selection is a creative force to create something new, then you don't understand how it works. This textbook says natural selection can lead to evolution. That is simply a lie. Natural selection will keep the species strong. Here's how it works. If you worked in a factory that produced cars, and your job was to select the good ones to go through and select the bad ones and reject them, quality control, how long would it take your selection process to change the car to an airplane? Really fast. It won't happen. <laughs> See, the design engineers change it to an airplane, okay? The problem is, all the species seem to have a natural tendency to produce the same type of offspring if there's varieties that are too far off, too far bizarre, and you know, too strange, some mutation happens, they're likely to be selected against. Natural selections, something's going to kill them, okay? If they can't run as fast or can't fly as fast or whatever, they're going to have some predator wipe them out. Okay, I agree. That's just sad and tragic, but it happens. But natural selection is simply a, a, a stabilizing force. It's not a creative force. So, I agree with natural selection, but it doesn't help your theory at all. Well, my theory is basically that you're saying that lies shouldn't be in books, and I'm, I'm considering these lies as being observations that are written in books, and then, that everyone has the right to not read these textbooks if they don't want to. Well, wait, 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 no, so slow down, no, we'll talk more time. You're saying there are lies in the books, and everyone has a right to not read those books if they don't want to. Does everyone have the right to not pay for those books if they don't want to? Yeah, I think so. You think so? Good. Yeah, you're on my side then. Thank you, sir. That's all I want. Don't teach lies in the books. But we're not teaching lies in the books. We're teaching observations in the books. They're not Observa teaching lies. Observations lead to creativity. Creativity leads to new science, and new science leads to truth. And the fact is, even if you say that, 
that all these lies are in the books, right? These lies that we can't teach our we teach our kids. You're, what are we supposed to substitute it for? Operational? No, 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 no. But I'm you're sorry. not saying it. You're right. You're exactly going to say One thing at a time. Not, now, look, you the burden of proof. Wait, the burden of proof is not on creationism. It's on right. us. But if we took the lies out of the textbooks. There would still be a lot of good biology. There would be good, a whole shitload of good biology. Okay. I'm, sorry. I'm not against biology. I'm against teaching lies. It's not true that the embryo has gill slits. That was proven wrong 128 years ago. So what why are you going to replace with Paul. those lies? Well, can you say you replace it with the rest of the things? No. Yeah. I don't have to find a replacement for it. It's a lie taken out. It shortens the book by three pages. Okay. Here's the textbook used at this university. I have that. Am I right? I really okay. like it. On page 1,018. That's actually a different example. That's not the embryology one. No. Nope. Uh, uh, so, so then, but. Embryology? Then, okay, yeah. I looked that up if you want. Yeah, see if you can find the embryology one. I just saw that without my glasses on. Okay, excuse me. Oh, because they have that section of the embryo uh, circle. Yeah. So just check the index, see if they have embryology. So, it is your argument we can't take a line out of the book until I find a replacement? If you're going to attack textbooks, you should be attacking media. You should be attacking legal uh, law. And oh, wait, wait. I'm not paying, paying for the media. You're, 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 I'm not paying for the media. Hey, I'm well, paying I'm for the this crazy idea. Your kids watch the media, they listen to lies, and then they go out and spend their money because of the media. Okay. I'm not <laughs> paying for the media. Okay. <laughs> so it's not, directly, you're not paying for the media. If the media ever Did becomes... you buy PowerPoint? Did you purchase PowerPoint? Well, listen now. If the media ever becomes tax-funded... Okay. Then we'll have the same argument. You mean if you're not paying out of your own pocket for your own purpose? You mean yeah, you're paying it for I don't take the purpose. newspaper. I don't want to pay for the propaganda, so I don't take it. Okay? Somebody else wants to so do this time. This, this entire presentation that you provided no. was based on economics. You're missing the whole point. If we took the 20 lies out of the textbooks, that doesn't have hurt anybody. It, it, it actually improves the teaching of biology. Are you sure? Take lies out of the books. Let me ask you this. Take observations out of the books and what oh, happens. No, 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 everyone knows everything about skeleton muscles and, and your digestive system. I can read that over and over and over again, but that's not gonna that's not gonna want make me want to be more intuitive and be more creative. And I if I read something about vestigial organs and I'll be actually curious about it, because there's not not there isn't enough facts on just vestigial organs. Because there are not enough facts doesn't mean it's not it, it is a lie. Wait, 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 wait. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and okay. study more about this digital organ because the fact is I'm a scientist and I'm interested. But if you take out, if you take out these so-called lies, you're limiting people, you're limiting, you're, you're limiting education. That's basically what you're doing. Okay, now, now, you listen to what you said. <laughs> if we take lies out of wait, wait. textbooks, we're limiting education. <laughs> okay, now, you need help, okay? And I'm here to help you. And okay. my, Uh, uh, taking lies out of the textbooks is common sense. If you had a book, if you were teaching math and found a book that said 2 plus 2 is 5, would you want that to be corrected? Of course. Is taking that out of the textbook, you know, stopping education? No, it's helping education. I want you to teach evolution if you use facts to back it up. I just don't want you to use lies to back it up, that's all. Go ahead. Um, I would like to refer to um, fossils. I am a history, I'm Timothy Underwood, I am a history major, and I am not a scientist. My knowledge of the question of evolution extends um, very little beyond um, general popularizations that you will find within the field. Uh, I, I would like to add, you argue that um, all of the evidence for evolution that is put forth are lies. No, no, no. I did not say all of the evidence for evolution is lies, okay? And the things I pointed out are Do lies. You Those are you did say, uh, Okay, I, okay. I all evidence. of the evidence that I'm aware of that is typically used to support the evolution theory has been proven wrong. Take it out of the books. Now, if that leaves you with no evidence, I'm sorry. Get a new theory. That's always one, that's one thing. That, did you find gill slits in here? No, I found two other things. Okay. okay, if Gilslitz is not in there, this is wonderful. That's a success. Berkeley is not teaching one of the 25 lies in the textbook. Yay! Insects being resistant to insecticides. Insects being resistant to insecticides. Seven of this book here, six, six edition, and it says under the title of an example. Of <coughs> women provide evidence. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, examples of natural selection provide evidence of evolution. So page 437, if you go two pages over 439, uh, 
wait, don't, don't lose it. Okay, then we find the uh, homology. So that's on 4, 439. Okay, so they're saying similar structures in the four limbs is evidence of evolution. Okay, they're welcome to believe that. But similar structures in four limbs might be evidence of a common designer. The Honda and the Toyota both have four wheels. That doesn't prove they came from a skateboard. It's a good design that works. So this is an example of propaganda, not science. This is right on topic here. If you're going to say majority opinion is how we're supposed to decide right from no, wrong. No, I'm going to say that the opinion of the geneticists is how we should decide whether they come from different chromosomes or not. Okay. The now opinion, that's all. The in opinion of which geneticists? Which I have read, written by a uh, okay. geneticist. Um, if say a geneticist, Richard Dawkins. Or okay, Richard Dawkins, yeah. He wouldn't debate me either. If, if, a geneticist <laughs> is, if a geneticist is a creationist, if I can find a geneticist that has a PhD in genetics who doesn't believe in evolution, and they say, hey, Hogan's right. This is not evidence for evolution. It might be evidence for a designer. Would, 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 his, would, would a creationist's opinion matter, even if he had 10 PhDs, or is he automatically disqualified just because he's a creationist? You tell me. If he had 10 legitimate PhDs, his opinion would be valid. <laughs> and it would be on the part of the question if okay. we're going into what's the opinion right. of consensus opinion right. within the scientific okay. community. Let me try to get I need the vast majority of right. the scientists. I want to try to get you to see a bigger problem. picture here. Okay. I want to try to get you to see a bigger picture. I have several people on my staff, I think seven, who are from the Soviet Union. Okay? If it's including my daughter in law. If a teacher stood up 10 years ago in the Soviet Union and said, kids, I don't think communism works. I think capitalism is a better system. Would you agree, 10 or 15 years ago, that teacher would certainly lose his job and possibly lose their life. They certainly would end up in Siberia if they're still alive. There would be a great pressure. The, the teachers could honestly stand up in the Soviet Union 15 years ago and say, all teachers believe in communism. Yeah, because what happens if you don't? Okay? We've got the same exact pressure here in America. I can show you 50 examples if you'd like, including Professor uh, Dean uh, Kenyon over at San Francisco State, where I worked a couple hours ago, who nearly lost his job simply because he changed from being an evolutionist to being a creationist. They said, well, then you can't teach here. They took him from tenured professor to a lab assistant. I'll give you 50 examples in a minute if you'd like that. Now, I'm telling you, here at Berkeley University, the land of free speech, if a professor gets up and says, in a biology class, and says, kids, I, I have really doubts about this evolution theory. I think what we're teaching are lies. I don't think this stuff is true. They would lose their job. You don't have free speech here. You guys don't know the first thing about free speech at Berkeley I University. Agree, I, I would agree that most likely should um, a professor stand up and uh, say, I do not any longer believe in evolution, he would be in extreme danger of his job. Why? Well, Why? Yeah, Why? 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 Because... Because you have to believe in evolution to teach it Berkeley. Because... And therefore, the I teach you believe in evolution. No, this is what you're missing. No, because more than 99% of the professors at all universities think that, that creationism has no basis in fact. Okay, but well, it's science well, well, science well, I, I, I want to repeat this so they can hear this, okay? You're saying 99% of the professors believe that creationism has no basis in fact. We didn't, I didn't talk about creationism tonight. I said there are lies in the textbooks. Take them out. Fine. 99% of um, professors in the relevant fields believe that evolution is true and that there are facts to support it. Okay. And those who and they um, argue that those who attack that, that claim that there are not facts well, to support take it one, one are section. incorrect. Look, you can ask all you want, but let's just go one at a time so people can understand this. Okay. I don't think you're correct that 99% of the professors believe in evolution. Washington Times did a survey, May 31st, it's in the Washington Times, 1998, the last one I'm aware of, six years ago, that said 55% of the U.S. of the natural scientists in the United States believe in Darwinian evolution. That's slightly more than half, 55%. I can what show you the that was referring to is essentially whether those evolutionists were atheists or theists. No. The, uh, the question was simply, do you believe in Darwinian evolution? 55% responded yes, 45% responded no. So, it's what, not correct to say that 90 What was the definition within the context of the question well, of Darwinian evolution? My point is, it wouldn't matter if everybody believed in evolution. Again, it's a belief. Everyone does believe in evolution. Not necessarily on um, the specific wait, wait, wait. limited so what definition. Say, what did you just say? Everyone does believe in evolution? All scientists, practically all scientists, do 
to believe in okay. the relevant field. Let me ask you a question then. Is it possible for a scientist to not believe in evolution? Or by definition, are they automatically disqualified from being a scientist because they believe in creation? Would that automatic, the guy who invented the MRI, would you consider him a scientist? He believes yes, in creation. Yes, he's not in a relevant field. Not in a relevant field. Okay. Um, what you're arguing here is an argu argument from majority opinion, and you better take a debate class on This won't no, hold up I'm at all. No, I'm not arguing from majority opinion. Yes, you are. I'm arguing from the universal opinion among the experts. Okay. Was there, arguing from was, was there a universal opinion among the experts in the Soviet Union that communism is good 15 years ago? Was that a universal no, opinion? No, there are probably wasn't from things that I've heard, and that is irrelevant to the question. It's very relevant to the question. You have the same academic denial of freedom here yeah, you, 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 you are right that it is relevant to the question. It's very relevant. Just because there's academic suppression of a particular view at a particular time in history has nothing to do with truth. The truth is, the evolution theory is only supported by these lies I shared. Now, take the lies out of the books and tell me what evidence do you have to support your theory. I want to see it. Okay. Well, let me try to do that. Um, the essential basis, I believe, for much of what led toward evolutionary theory was the, the idea that um, species change over time. We find that because of the sequencing of the fossil record. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, it's one, one topic at a time. You're saying the evidence for evolution comes from the sequence in the fossil record. Would you entertain the thought that there is no fossil record, there are simply a bunch of bones in the dirt, and we are putting our interpretation on them? And if you find an animal buried lower than another animal, it may be a result of hydrologic sorting. It may yes, be pure coincidence. It is not true. Wait, wait, wait. In a court of law, in a court of law, in a court of law, hydrological sorting would not fly. Your evidence would not fly as evidence. Correct. So, now, would, would it be possible sorting as an explanation for the sequence no. of fossil record would not apply? I'm because saying because it does not fit with um, it the fit water, water dynamics. dynamics. No, so because it does not fit with water dynamics. Hydrological sorting does not explain the sequencing of the fossil record. Okay. First place, there is not a good sequencing to the fossils. Begin number one. Secondly, yes, fossils are you will never find a whale in the Cambrian layers. You will never find any mammal in the Cambrian layers. Okay. You will not find a bird in the Cambrian layers. You will not find anything but, Cambri <coughs> but animals that exist within that period within the Cambrian okay. layers. Who is interpreting whether a layer is Cambrian or not? Would you agree? Right. Obviously, the Cambrian layers are that area. I, between, say, several hundred feet of second. I do not know the exact place. Are you they are an area which are beneath these other layers. In which you will only find these All right. animals. You will let's, let's let a few more people ask questions. There's a lot of people I want to ask questions tonight. But you are a classic example of how your training is blinding you to the obvious, okay? You're, you're saying the, the, there is there's limestone. Limestone is found in limestone every... Limestone is not what makes up the Cambrian layers. What makes up the Cambrian layers is the presence of those specific types of fossils within the layer oh, okay. and different Listen, types of fossils that are always the same said. types of fossils above the layer okay. and above it. What you just said is precisely my point. The presence of Cambrian layers is determined by the types of fossils they find in them. Doesn't matter where you find it, the fact is it has these trilobites or these animals, therefore no, it's Cambrian. It, it is determined by its place in the sequence. You'll find these types of fossils in the Cambrian layer. You'll okay. find these types of fossils. You need to watch our video number Cambrian. four with an open mind. It'll get you converted over. If you really are, maybe your mind's already closed, I don't know. But if you're really open minded, you need to look at this one more time. Okay, the geologic how I showed you petrified trees standing up connecting these layers. Are you still telling me those layers are different ages? What? You still believe they're different ages, don't you? I'm saying that, I'm saying okay. that you're not going to find. All right, let's let somebody else talk for a minute. Go to the end of the line, look at somebody else. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Don't want your flow to get Okay. Okay, good. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Hogan. Hi. I forgot your name now. What is it? My name is Michelle Markstein, and Michelle. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here in the integrative biology department. I have a PhD in genetics. Okay. And, uh, but before we start talking about biology, I first have a question for you. Sure. Okay. Um, 
So you showed us very beautiful polished slides, um, basically giving us evidence that scientists are liars. Wait, 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 then, no, 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 you don't, don't, don't misconstrue my did position. Did you not give no, us evidence don't, that scientists are liars? Don't misconstrue my position. You say that several times? I said, this is a lie. This should not be taught in the textbooks. Yes. Now, and if you are teaching this right. as part of your evidence, right. then you are a liar. Okay, so if you're not teaching that, then you're fine. Scientists who are pushing this theory are no, in essence no. liars. Not scientists who are pushing evolution are liars. Scientists who are teaching these lies are liars. Okay, but... Let's get, this, let's get it straight. Okay. I, just, just so, because somebody that believes Berkeley in evolution... professors who are teaching this are, teaching are liars. Berkeley are professors who are teaching evolution. No, there you go again. You're ah, misunderstanding. Okay. I did I not misunderstand. say... I misunderstand. Your slides are beautiful. No, no, no. I missed the point. Let's just get a go on this here. Okay. I did not say a professor who teaches evolution is a liar. A professor who teaches the gill slits on the embryo exist is a liar. I will say that. A professor who teaches the whale has a vestigial pelvis is either ignorant or a liar. Right. How many heard me say that right. tonight? A whole bunch of times. Okay. Yes, me so too. You, okay, I, you heard I, something. I no, no, scientists you're trying. Liars were pushing a theory that even a five-year-old could see is wrong. Is okay. that not what your point was throughout tonight's talk? My point was that a five-year-old can tell you a dog and a wolf are the same kind of animal. And a dog and a banana are not. Okay. Now, do you believe dogs are related to bananas? Ultimately, yes. Ultimately, yes. Okay. Do you believe dogs and bananas and humans ultimately came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago? Okay. I do you think believe, just yes or no, do you believe that? Okay, I don't think it's correct to say yes or no. I want to point out to people here who are not familiar with his type of argument, okay? Um, I'll show you right from your textbook. No, 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 let's not go to the textbook. Let, let's just have a talk, you and me. Watch the other point. Come on, I'll be like friend, I, I challenge you. Yeah. I challenge you to just okay. have a conversation. No, no, no. no. The folly of believing that a dog and a banana have a common ancestor. Let me, let, me, let, me tell you, let me tell you about what I study. Okay, okay. tell me. But, but, but first, I want you to still answer my question, then we can talk about um, some evidence for evolution, okay, okay. based on what I actually study, which, just as a little teaser, are commonalities between fruit flies, those things that you say we mutate and have, cur you know, make them have curly wings. Right, right. Okay, I, I find those flies very useful, actually. And uh, I see commonalities between fruit flies. And, and guess what? Human beings. Wait, wait, wait. And I'll, and I'll tell you about that. You're saying, you're saying, as a, as a postdoctoral fellow. Fellow. There you go. But you fellow. don't need to say doctor in front of my name. Okay. I'm pretty secure about it. Okay, that's fine. I don't care about the doctor either. You're saying that there are similarities between fruit flies and humans. And this proves. No, I'm not saying it proves okay. evolution at all. There's a misconception, so I am not an evolutionary biologist. I am not qualified to debate you on most of the issues you put up there. One okay. thing that you guys may not know, okay, is that evolutionary biology is basically the fabric of bio biological sciences. So many of us, while we're not studying, um, we're not experts in geology or asking ourselves how one animal, how animals evolve, we use the relatedness between animals to make discoveries. And in my case, for example, I study something called innate immunity. And it's a very ancient type of immune system. And it actually exists in animals such as fruit flies, in an animal such as us. And what I have found in looking at the genome of these animals is that there's a conserved, what we call a regulatory signature. I've been able to find this in the fruit fly, and now I'm going to use this information to probe the human genome to look for immunity genes and to understand how that works. Okay. And do you know why? To help human health. That's, That's why. I'm proud of you. Now listen. Not to not to, not to not to You are missing. You are missing the entire point. If there are similarities between humans and fruit flies, yes, that might prove the same guy designed them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree thank with you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with you. So I want to now point out that one of the flyers we have discusses one such scientist. He was one of the heads of the Human Genome Project. You may know of him. His name is Dr. Francis Collins. I've never met him. I've heard of him. Okay, so Dr. Collins was the head of the Genome Project. He's both an MD and a PhD. And Dr. Collins is also a Christian. Okay, so actually there are many scientists who are Christians and also embrace evolution. What oh, I, I Dr. Cullen says no is that right. if, if God decided to use the mechanism of evolution to create human beings, you look, you look nervous. You look nervous. Calm down. Calm down. It's okay. You know you why I'm nervous? nervous? Because okay. I don't have the 
rhetorical skills that you do. No, no, I am winning this argument because I'm right. No, I'm right. Besides, 
If they lost their legs, that is the opposite of evolution. That's correct. That is now, losing something. Either you are ignorant of evolutionary theory, or you're telling a lie. How did the, do you believe the whale evolved from a land-dwelling creature, like a cow, like the folks at, at the National Center for Science Education believe? Yes, I do. I don't, I, I mean, you can, you can. Then I showed you their brochure from Bossy to Blowhole. That's a cow to a whale, okay? I, I, I'm not saying that I particularly believe that it's a cow, but I believe that it's You can. believe it was a land-dwelling animal that yes. turned into a whale, okay. Do you realize that whales have their nose on the top of their head? Yes. Okay, and most animals on land have their nose on the front of their head. Right, and there is in fact a fossil record that shows the movement of the, of the blowhole from the nose to the top of the head. If somebody taught you that, and you, and you paid to get taught that, you, they stole your money from you, son, okay? Uh, the whale... Okay. Uh, the, um, I couldn't find the, the whale under vestigial organs, but I did find on page uh, 439 about the snake that it had the quote unquote hind legs or remnants of hind legs, vestigial organs. It's a very brief, very brief paragraph. So, okay. It is the same example, though, of losing instead of gaining. And if you think the whale came from a land based animal and went back into the water, Okay, that's what right. you think, right? And lost or lost whatever, and gained whatever needed, and lost whatever needed. Because there's a lot of differences between right. most land-based mammals and a whale. A lot of differences, okay? Um, I am not aware of any land-based mammals that have the same type of feeding system for their young that whales do, where they actually squirt the milk in. Most land-based animals have to suck on the milk. The whale actually squirts it into the baby's mouth. Right. This is what we would call an adaptation. That's an adaptation. No, I would say that was designed, okay? Now, if you want to believe it's an adaptation, you can believe that. But you just left science and went to religion. And this is what you're not seeing, okay? Uh, here we go. Uh, All right. So, bossy the blowhole. Uh, folks, and maybe I'm not getting this, but are, were they teaching at one time that the cow evolved to the whale? Am I getting How many are saying that? No. How many are saying that? Oh, nobody's saying that. Okay. Maybe I'm getting something wrong here. No. Yes. Um, let's see. <laughs> Hey, I'm willing to correct, honestly, I really am, okay? If I'm wrong. Uh, let's see. Uh, whale's pelvis. You're saying there is fossil evidence of the no blowhole moving from the front of the head to the top of the head. From, from the nose, yeah. From the nose? There's, there's, do you think there is fossil evidence for a whale? Are you referring to uh, Amelocetus? Uh, I, I or don't have specific names on in international okay. relations. I think you have been crippled by your education, and it's a shame you had to pay for that. It's worse that I had to help pay for that. Now, uh, if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine, okay? But that's not science, huh? You've been, you've been sold a religion. They've, I've seen a line of fossils. You have seen a line of fossils? Where they have the nose closer to the front and moving towards the top of the head of skulls of whales. You have now, seen this PowerPoint presentation refute that. Well, yes, was it the fossils or was it drawings? They no, drawings? they were fossils. It was a video program that showed the skulls on the table. Oh, a video program. Now, I can show you. I've got a video clip here showing a tricycle turning into a tiger. It's amazing what you can do with these different video programs. You know? <laughs> what, what, is, what does this have to do with... That's my point. What is your fossils? What is your... First I'm place? saying there's a fossil... I mean, I'm saying... Well, first of all, my main point is that you have a misunderstanding of what evolution is if you think that you can have the opposite of it. Now, I don't want to lose that point. Okay. Because we, we got to keep I, it I understand. I understand right. your point. So you're saying the fact that it's losing its legs and turning into a whale is not really... That's still an example for evolution. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You, you can't go backwards. You can't evolution. go backwards? You can't go backwards because there's no backwards. There's no backwards for evolution. Right. Okay. There's no forward. There's no forward, there's no backward. Just everything stays the same. Change. You're a creationist, man. <laughs> everything stays the same. <laughs> I, I say things change towards more adapted to, uh, from less adapted. Okay, now, if you want to believe that, that, that's fine. But I pointed out, no fossils would count as evidence in a court of law. Because oh, you could, a court of law have to do with science? Well, because you keep bringing it up. Okay, something that is something that would hold up in a court of law as real evidence. Some, something that ought to be considered. You got a professor here at this university, Philip Johnson, that wrote three books saying if you put Darwin on trial, it wouldn't pass, okay? That's it's, a court of law. It has nothing to do with scientific inquiry. 
It has to do with juror selection and lawyers and, and, and law. No, I'm saying the evidence wouldn't stand actual real scrutiny. Anybody could come up and say, Your Honor, he found some bones in the dirt. He doesn't know they had any kids. You're right. Dismissed. Next evidence. No fossils count. You're, you're saying that no fossils I'm saying, count because... I'm saying if you, find, right. if you find some fossils like this, and you want to say that is evidence that a whale came from a cow or an animal on land or a bear, whatever you want, okay? I, I'm saying, Your Honor, he can't prove those bones right there had any children. Could you prove some bones you found in the dirt had any offspring, let alone different offspring? And why would you no, think... but I could prove that they had parents. Oh, yeah, I could agree with that. Now, right. see, you're missing the point. But now, if you find many fossils in the dirt... If you find you know, the fact that you find millions of fossils in the dirt... That's proof of a flood. Now, that, that's millions... <laughs> So we're going to have, please, no one else get in line for questions, but we're going to have to make it quicker. I know that not all the questions are being answered, and I know that there still seems to be some disagreement so, in the room. I've sensed that. <laughs> all right, so let, let's get back to the original point. Pass the line. Yeah, okay. Pass the line. Pass the line. The original point, which, which is the, the direction of evolution. There is no direction for evolution. That's right. what you said. There's no, no meaning, there's no, forward, there's no going back, there's no coming back. I'm no saying there's, there's from less adapted to more adapted. Now, would you agree with that? I'm not saying it doesn't happen. All things are fairy tale. You're, all this is taking all right. place in your mind. It doesn't take place in but your mind. But you're the point of opposite of evolution. I mean, do, okay. do you understand? I understand that you are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, son. You, you you want to have people come up here and refute you, correct? Uh, yeah, so far I'd like to see All right, that. so I'm refuting this one point. This one point that the whale losing its legs is is not is still an example for evolution. Okay, if you believe that, that's fine. I disagree, but go ahead. Yes, next one. Have to go have to hurry here, we've got a few minutes. first of all, everybody seems really angry. <laughs> no. I'm not angry, I'm having fun. I could do this every day. I really could. I, mean, I love this. I mean, I have the PowerPoint. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I understand your point about not wanting to pay your money for what you call lies. Although, I think what I, the big question that I've had sort of since I've walked in here is, are you assuming that these textbook publishers know that what they're saying is not true? Okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Basically, who benefits? I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to attack. Who benefits from these lies in the textbooks? Who benefits from this? And um, why is everyone arguing so vehemently? Okay. I don't know as far as benefits or not benefits. Why they're kept in the textbooks, I'm going to say probably the authors of the textbooks honestly think they're teaching the truth. The publishers of the textbooks honestly think they're teaching the truth. The teachers in the school who are teaching this honestly think they're teaching the truth. I am pointing out this has been proven wrong. Real science would clear this stuff up. They wouldn't allow lies to continue in the textbooks. The problem is, if you remove these lies that I mentioned, there's nothing left to support the evolution theory, and that raises red flags. Because along with creation, which is the only other alternative to evolution, there comes a whole lot of baggage like a creator and rules, you know, like thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what they're really running from. So, I, all I said was we should not allow lies to be taught in the textbooks in tax-funded school. If somebody wants to teach, start a private school and teach lies all they want, go for it. Man, I don't care what you teach. You can teach your kids in a private school that if you blow yourself up and kill 10 Israelis, you get to go to heaven and have 72 virgins. Why? So, okay, you can teach it. But I don't want to pay for that. Um, Go ahead. Well, that is taught in a number of schools. Um, that is taught in our schools? No, not, not in this country, okay. generally. Um, I think, the, I guess then the biggest question that's brought up after that is, if all of those lies, or at least untruths... Okay, if, if these it, untruths were taken out so of the books... So all of these untruths were taken out of the books from what you know, and I guess for many of the people have questions and might know more about this subject than me, if all of these untruths that you brought up were, were taken out, would there then be any basis for believing that 
there was an original idea of this descent from original creatures to base like mole uh, evolutionary molecular biology on. Or, okay. or even better, if you took all those things out, what would you have? You would have a good textbook with lots of biological science. There's a lot of good biology that ought to be taught. Evolution's unrelated to the subject. Okay? okay. I'm in favor of biology. I taught it 15 years. I like biology. Hi, my name is Tom, and uh, I study neurobiology here, but I don't think that's relevant to this subject. Okay. Um, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. Um, I also believe in evolution. We can fix that. Hang in there, Tom. We can fix that. <laughs> I mean, obviously, that's my belief. But um, That's your what? That's my belief. Your what? Belief. Belief? Yes. Good. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I, I, don't, I don't disagree that evolution can be a theory and can be a religion. I'm not going to argue that technicality. Just uh, pointing that out. Go ahead, Tom. Right, right. I know, I know. Okay. And I respect the fact that you pointed out the embryology is false. You know, I didn't know that before this lecture, so I benefited from this lecture. So, yeah. well, hey, yeah. Well, yeah, I know. I, I like that. Um, could you go back to the uh, slide where you pointed out the uh, the horses? The horse evolution? Yeah, or I don't var think variation in species, I guess. Variations? Oh, okay. Because I have on like kind. The, uh, the slide on kinds. Variations happen, but they have limits. Let's see. Uh, I mentioned about the, there's a variety of horses. Right. Uh, this that, one? Right. So, okay. uh, yeah. are, are you saying that those are the same kind? I think a five-year-old could tell you a zebra and a horse are the same kind of animal. They're still infertile. Okay. Zebras and horses can still breed. Okay. So, yeah, uh, the same kind, not the same species. Right. So, suppose I put a human being at where the uh, cabello is, and a, a chimpanzee where the, uh, uh, the burrow is, and then if I put a, you know, a gorilla where the uh, zebra is, would you say people, kids, five-year-old kids, would say they're very similar, they're the same kind? Well, there may be some five-year-olds who believe that. Right, but, right. But, but that can happen, right? Well, are they interfertile? Um, no, I don't okay. think they are. Then they're not the same kind. These two are interfertile. They're the same kind. Okay, so what, what about a horse and a dog? Wait, I showed you quite a few examples uh, where the horses, zebras, and asses can all be cross-bred. There's a website dealing with that. Right, but their offsprings are not fertile. Doesn't matter. They can, they can produce an offspring. Okay. Okay. The human and ape cannot even produce the first generation, let alone a sterile generation. Okay, but you're okay. saying generation. What? Oh, maybe somebody here has tried it. I don't know. I wouldn't surprise people. Go ahead. <laughs> different animals, different species, um, in a category that show that they're the same kind, the same can be done for, for hominids, for primates. Well, first of all, the differences between apes and humans, I think, are pretty profound. There are millions of differences. Like 90% like of DNA differences? Well, it's actually 5% difference. Okay, 5% difference. Okay. Would, you, would you say two things that are 95% in common are very similar? I'd say they have the same man, the same designer. Yeah, the same same guy. Same same, same and no, not not ancestors. No, no, no. Oh, okay. it, would, it okay. wouldn't prove the same ancestor. It could prove uh, it could prove a lot of things. Actually, the similarity between a Honda Prelude and a Honda Accord are pretty pretty striking. Yes, they're from the same maker, Honda. You got the point. Oh. You got the point. Oh, I, do, I, I, I do get the point. I believe in Christ. I believe He created certain things. But do you there, believe there's it's possible? Wait, wait, wait. Do you believe it's possible that humans and apes? have similarities because they simply have a common designer. Is that a possibility? That they're not even related, they're just the same guy designed them all. That can be a possibility, yes. Okay, is that something that ought to be taught in schools, maybe? Uh, if it's a theory. Oh, no, no, it, 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 no, it oh, can't no, be, no, it, no. It, should, it should be taught if it's labeled as a theory. Okay. I, I'm not saying that, you know, creationism should, shouldn't be taught because, I mean, theory okay. of evolution is a theory that's taught in schools. Would you agree, so other would you agree that it's not taught in schools? I, I, I do agree it's not okay. fine. Okay. And, and I think tax of uh, you know tax dollars from Christians uh, should not, if they don't want, uh, be funded in public schools that teach uh, a theory that they object. I, I agree with you. So tax dollars should not go to teach evolution in public schools. They should teach it in private schools. Uh, unless the people that pay the taxes agree that they should. But but let's go back to the subject. Wait, 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 wait. How many of you pay taxes for the schools in this state and you do not believe evolution should be taught, but you're paying for it anyway? How many of you resent that? Okay. Oh, now, I, want, I really want to hear Skip's question. We've only got a few minutes left. Let me just point out one thing. Okay. okay. The textbooks say humans and orangutans are 96% similar, proving a common ancestor 15 billion years ago. This is ludicrous, but I'll just give them that. Okay. Marty Maddox, one of the leading genome researchers, said the difference between humans and his nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, it's a gap of 48 million nucleotides and a change of only three nucleotides.
nucleotides is fatal to an animal. If this is a guy saying you change three things, you're probably going to die, and there's 48 million differences, that's when they thought it was 1.6% difference. Now they know it's actually 95% similar, which is 5% difference. So it's much worse than they think, and even still, they're missing the whole point. Similarities don't prove any ancestry. It might prove the common designer. So I guess horses and okay, burrows to barn, they're not the same type. They're not the same kind. Girls are not the same. No, 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 no. That's not what I said. Zebras and stuff. The horses, basically. The horses horses and zebras are the same kind. Okay. okay. Yeah. But humans are not. Humans are not the same as horses. No, no. no. To, to me, there's an inconsistency, but that's my opinion. I, I'm going to yield my time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay, um, just before I start, I make a quick comment. I disagree with you when you say the burden of proof is on the evolutionists. Because at this university and all over the UC system and universities all over the country, scientists, grad students, some of them are probably here, are applying evolutionary principles and publishing their work in scientific papers. That's how the message works. I know of no scientific papers that have come out of dinosaur adventure land that have appeared in Nature or Science or, or Cell or any of the other major publications. Now, hang on, that said, let's move on to the questions because I don't think them a chance. None of this slap and run stuff, okay? One comment at a time. If you want to use that as evidence, you have got to be kidding. The fact that nobody publishes in a science journal that believes in creation might prove there's some, some big uh, uh, blackout on creationist information, just like the Soviet Union wouldn't publish an article about capitalism and 10 years wham, ago. Wham, wham, wham. Go do some science and then bring it to them and convince them that you have something. Because every major revolution in science has taken a long time. You know, some guy doesn't just pop up with a new idea and they say, hey, that's great. Alfred Wegener, who discovered plate tectonics, died before his theory was accepted by geology. Okay. It's if a you want to go game. there, let's move on. We don't have time for that tonight, but we can right. go there. Right. Let's, let's, let's move on to my question. Watch my video number seven. The first I have. Time I've seen, seen all your videos that's over funny. and over again. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get you converted. I really am. <laughs> you may. You may. I may get you converted. You and it's a crazy world. Okay. Now, on exactly. my question. Earlier, you made a statement, something about that evolution plays no role in the medical field. I want to make sure I get that exactly right. I said there is no doctor when he's doing heart surgery that cares anything about evolution. He just better really, really, really know his biology. All right, well, let, let's go. Let's, let me, let's is that what I said? Did I get that right? Okay, go ahead. All right. Would you say that, that you're saying evolution really plays no role in medicine? If you want to go to antibiotic resistance, I think you're opening up right, real let, big. Let's, let, let's move on quickly. I, I'll, I'll make this challenge to you. I'll go home and I'll reserve the URL, doctorsandevolution.org. Okay. I'll let you write the statement, anything you want about evolution and its relation to medicine. And I know of no single doctor, I can't name one off the top of my head, who actually uses evolutionary principles in his work. But I'll bet you in 30 days I can have 20 practicing MDs who will all cite, maybe even publish papers they do, where they apply evolutionary principles in their work. Will you accept that challenge? I believe you're probably right, you could do that, but listen carefully. What they're going to do, the doctor... So now we're talking about, you admit that evolutionary principles are applied out there in the medical field. No. Where is creationism applied in medicine? You're missing it now. If, if a doctor says, if a doctor writes a paper for your uh, website that says, I use evolution in my, in my practice, ask him specifically what he means. When he's doing surgery on somebody, he doesn't care. Not, or why are you limited only to surgery? And if I can't find a surgeon who actually says, yes, I do use it. Okay. Will you, will, you then, will you then retract the statement you made tonight you on can, your website? Skip, you could probably find a surgeon that believes, you know, life came from Mars or that there are little green men, in, you know, living under the White House. And you, you could also people. probably find one that believes the Earth is only 6,000 years old. You probably can. I bet I can find a lot of those. All right, so let's move on. Let's move on. Right on so the point uh, is... So you're not accepting the challenge. Is that it? Is I, that what you're saying? I don't think it's a challenge. Okay, if you want to do a website and see how many doctors believe in evolution and how many doctors believe in creation, I think you'll be surprised. There'll be many thousands. We, we won't get anywhere with that. They do want to give the other person answer. Hey, let, let me would, ask you this. Would you agree there might be many, many, many doctors who would say, hey, I'm a practicing physician, and I think evolution's a dumb theory. Oh, and absolutely. And you well, can also what's the find... Point? What's the point? It's the not point is that you, you made an insinuation that evolution doesn't play any role in medicine. No, you're making the insinuation that because a few doctors believe in evolution, therefore evolution is part of, of, of science. That's not so. If I true. find you 20 practicing, practicing medical people who apply it in their work, will you admit that evolutionary principles are valuable to modern science? I would like to see how they apply it in their work and define exactly what you mean by evolution. You're going to find it's nothing but variations like the bacterial right, resistance. Right, let's move on to this. Um, several times you say it up there that Heckel was convicted. Uh, Heckel was convicted of fraud by his university, correct? Six professors, University of Jena, 1975. 1875. Okay. If I can produce scholarly work to disprove that, will you quit making that claim? I, I would like. 
to say that correct, but I've seen several sources that say that's correct. Maybe 1970, 1874, is that what you're saying? Instead of 75, did I get the No, details? it's actually documented all throughout the or all throughout the historical record. If I if I can produce enough work and we can we can we can post this on a common website, will you quit making the claim? I'm not defending hate. I think I will make anybody that corrects me, if they can show something that I'm making that's inaccurate, I will correct it. Will you correct it? Do you teach that the vestigial organs is evidence for evolution or the whale has a vestigial pelvis? Does your website teach that some of these evidences I gave tonight is lies? Are you going to correct that website? No, because it's the consensus of the scientific community. And as far as I know, your creationist movement hasn't produced any valid science and published it to back up the claim that you made. It doesn't matter what we produce. You're saying. Yes, it does. And the burden's on you. This university does great research and publishes in the scientific journals. That's proof, well, all right. That's the big boys, Kent. That's the big boys. All right. I'll yeah, boy, if you publish in a journal, that's proof. Go check the Soviet Union and see how that logic works out. Okay. Hi, my name is Laura Coulter. I'm an attorney. I'm not a scientist, but some of my best friends are scientists. Um, so I just want to make one small, quick point. Okay. You'll be gentle with me. I'm a little nervous. Um, I believe I heard you say earlier that um, things that you can't observe directly, like sea lions losing their limbs as they move into the water, you know, over time, those kinds of things are fairy tales. Is that correct? Well, no, he said. If, we could, if, a, if a sea lion keeps going back to the water, which they do, that's going to prove that they you know, are losing legs and gaining fins. That's proof that sea lions are designed to live in water like they do. They do pretty good in the water. Even. What was, what was the, what, how was it that you described that it was a fairy tale? Well, if he, he was talking about how whales came from some kind of land-based animal and moved into the water and lost their legs. I, I said, well, you can believe that, but that's not, we don't observe that. And why, we don't, so we don't observe that, so it's a fairy tale, correct? Right? It's something that takes place in the imagination. I see, I see. People believe these animals make these changes. They never see them. Because they're not directly observed. Well, right. It's, right? It, so if, so it, if it takes millions of years, it's now not part of science, it's part of a fairy tale. So, so it's occurred to me that you've been making this claim multiple times through the evening that things that are not directly observed are not scientific. That's the definition of science. It's observable, I, testable. But, 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 but science actually consists of a lot of things that are not directly observed, that are indirectly observed and are inferential. So I'm just going to leave that at that, but I would actually like to say that you're actually being inconsistent because earlier you said that the Genesis story was a good story and that the Bible was a good story and um, I don't think What's that you were 6,000 years so, old. So I don't lawyer, think I that you have directly so observed. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not I'm a very asking, new lawyer. I'm, I'm not new. asking for um, the Genesis account to be taught. No, but you, I would like you to distinguish it from a fairy tale because you've said that things that are not directly observable are not science and are therefore fairy tales. And okay. I would like you to distinguish the Genesis account of creation the from a fairy tale. The difference we have with the Genesis account is but you do not have any direct evidence. You have not directly observed it, and you cannot. You don't have any evidence that Abe Lincoln was president 125 that's years right. ago. That's right. So okay. according to your logic, that's a fairy tale. No. All no. I'm saying is that no. according to your logic, Genesis is a fairy tale, and Lincoln is a fairy tale, and evolution is a fairy tale. All of those are fairy tales. Science is things we can observe, test, or demonstrate. I think and we, have we do this observe story. and test and demonstrate. We have indirect observations as well as direct observations, and that's what just okay. science. Okay. Would you tell me, as Genesis a lawyer, is distinguishable from science because it is not directly observable by anybody? Okay. As an attorney, I would like to know. I'm happy to. What, what is your best evidence for evolution? I'm not a scientist. I'm not. I don't observe creationism. I'm not asking for creation to be taught. Why it's called religion? Woven together a wide tissue of science. I know it's a huge fairy tale. I agree. We got to work on this. And I'm working on it. Okay? It's a big conspiracy. You're right. Go ahead. Last question. We're gonna have to quit. Oh, I gotta get the next guy though. I mean, what we gotta be out of here in six minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's enough of us can hold the janitors out. Okay. I'm Sarah, and and so I just want to ask a question. You know, like you like to back it up. And I'm trying, I'm getting that your main concern, because I don't consider you necessarily a scientist or a theologian, you're an educator. You're also a parent who's concerned about children learning things in school that are lost. Right, I, I'm a scientist and an educator. I'm also a parent. I'm also, as any parent would be, concerned about their children in school learning lies. Sure, sure. So one thing that, that I'm confused about is I don't understand why you have chosen to bias yourself in, in trying to write only certain lies that are in textbooks. Actually, because as, as 
we all know, there are many lies across disciplines and textbooks. One of the major jobs of educators these days, going through many versions of textbooks, <coughs> is to try to remove things like loaded questions. And, and this is something that is not um, only in the biological sciences. This is a problem in all disciplines. I agree. I okay, agree. so what I'm wondering is... Why am I buying and passing myself to this one? I taught science 15 years. This is my expertise. There's too many dragons to slay. I only got time to kill this one. But there are so many other things that are so well, much more damaging. You're an I, I'm a scientist. Okay, then find somebody who's a mathematician and fix the math books, and find an English person and fix the English books. We got a lot of work to do. But you're concerned about children and lies being in textbooks, Very and concerned. that sounds like the most important thing to you. So there are a lot of lies, like no, it's not the most important Native thing. American Indians, like bias and questions um, about ethnicity and socioeconomic standards. There are many, many, many bias in textbooks. And I feel like what you should do is probably focus on that and on education. And so why, why expend so much of your energy on debates in science and evolution, which you're not as well qualified for since you are an educator of basic, basic educational curriculum? Well, I guess everybody has to pick which dragons they want to slay, and this is the well, this is the one that bothers me because it has so much bigger implications. But why See, wouldn't you slay the dragons you're most qualified for? Let me answer your question. Because this evolution theory is not just a dumb theory, it's a dangerous theory. And this why is do what, you feel that way? This is exactly what motivated Adolf Hitler to kill the inferior species, the Jews and the blacks. This is precisely this theory, evolution. You're talking people. about social evolution, which many people disagree That's with. That's the result. Not That's the question. Okay, we've we we got to get out of here. I'll tell you what, can you, you let's answer. schedule another time. I'll come back. I love this place. I mean, this is great. I still don't get your answer. You're not, you're you're not hear answering answer. why you're choosing to oh, slay okay. rabbits that you're not as well qualified. Why does anybody choose any field of work? Why do people decide to be physicians instead of janitors? I mean, I decided to do this. It's my business. It doesn't matter to you. But you're not, you're not choosing to listen to experts in their field to help guide you in these wars against bias questions and textbooks. I'm uh, listening to, okay, we got not, not enough time to cover all night here tonight, but I would like the next guy to ask a question. I, I think I did answer your question. I can choose whatever I want in my life. I don't think you did. I'm not asking taxpayers to pay my salary. I can become a, I can do whatever I want in my life. But you're okay with taxpayers paying money for textbooks and history that talk no, about other problems. I'm not okay with that either. I just don't have time to say that. I don't have time to say that, right? Okay. Now, I'm so glad you came. Two, what, eight years ago in Canada, when I pulled out my pocket knife and volunteered, I, I just I want to explain something though now. So I pulled out my Swiss Army knife and said, I pulled out my Swiss Army knife and said, if you think the tailbone is best. Are you getting this on video, guys? You're getting this on video. I'm just refreshing your memory, okay? I said, I will pay, I will cut yours out if you'd like, if you think it's vestigial. You then wrote an article in your paper saying that I threatened you with a pocket knife. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Do you think it is an appropriate response to a scientific question to wave a pocket knife at somebody? Is that, Did, is that a reasonable response? Is it appropriate for you to lie and say I threatened you with my pocket knife? You were 75 feet away, son. You know, Six days, six thousand years ago. I believe that. that. That is a religion. Correct. I believe that's a religion. I call it a religion. And you're saying that you know, since creation and evolution are both religions, neither of them should be taught. Right. Not tax money. Right. Okay. You got it. Good. I, I, I understand what you're trying to say. Now, your your lectures and your ministry is not tax funded. Teaches is not tax funded. Oh, good. It teaches the literal story of Genesis. Oh, yeah. Right, you believe Absolutely. that, that uh, the earth was uh, created 6,000 years ago by God, exactly as it was in the first chapter of Genesis. Correct. I believe that story absolutely correct. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. You got it. Okay. Now, I, want, I, want, I, want, I want everybody to pay really close attention. Okay, this guy just said Genesis is his religion, right. and that is what he teaches in his ministry. Okay, now I'm going to ask a really simple question. Pay attention. Okay. What is the name of your ministry? 
Creation, science, evangelism. What is the word science doing in that name? Could you remove it, please? No, no. Science. Science. They are both religions, right? You, you said that yourself. You know, should be taught in schools because they're both religions. Well, then why are we teaching re evolution get, get in a biology to, class? Get back to my question. My question okay. is why are you misusing the name science in the name of your, your okay. ministry? If you were First honest, time. you would simply say, look, I believe in God. I am not afraid to stand up for what I believe in. I don't have to misname it science. I can just call it biblical creation. Now, let me answer the question, okay? First place, I'm not using any tax funds. I can name it whatever I feel like, whether you like it or not. Secondly, science deals with knowledge gained by observations, testing, and experimentation. All of the experimentation tells us dogs produce dogs. So there must have been originally a created kind because we never see a dog come from a non-dog. So the scientific evidence is strongly in favor of creation. That's why I call it science, create science, creation, science, science evangelism. Now, if it bothers you, tough. <laughs> your, your creation theory, My creation theory teaches that the Earth was created about 6,000 years ago, does it not? Correct. Now, first, before we go off on migration theory, which is not part of the topic tonight, Where's the evidence for evolution that I covered? I covered a bunch of lies. Yeah, you're, you're diverting from the question. Did you see that? Did you, see that? you didn't answer me at all. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm trying to your, on top. Now, I want you to clarify that your theory teaches that the Earth was created 6,000 years ago, or about 6,000 years ago. Right, right. And you are diverting the question, because I gave evidence against evolution, and you don't want to talk about that. You're trying to divert it over to creation. It doesn't matter what creation believes. I want you to use the word science correctly. Now. I am. Now, tell me about an experiment in which you measured, or someone measured, the age of the Earth, and their data told them that the Earth was 6,000 years old. I think there's a lot of experimental evidence that shows us it cannot be billions of years old. There are no, 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 give me evidence for your day. You are claiming in your scientific creation theory, right, he calls it scientific, that the Earth is 6,000 years old. There's a number there. Now, I want verification for that number. Okay. I have an eyewitness who wrote it down in a book called Genesis and told us this is how this is how it happened. He told us very clearly Adam was the first man. We have eyewitness accounts about Abe Lincoln. We're relying on those accounts from 160 years ago about Abe Lincoln. I'm relying on an eyewitness account that says there was no death till Adam sinned. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Genesis chapter 5, verse 9, I believe. You can look in the Bible and add up the dates. I have an eyewitness. What do you have? If you are Christians, I know there are a lot of Christians in the audience tonight. Wait, wait, wait. If you want to make a speech, you need to get your own crowd, okay? If you want to make a speech, they invited me to come speak tonight, okay? If you, if you believe in God and you are firm in your faith, yeah, you yeah. do not need to misname it science in order to tell the people that you believe in God. You can simply be honest and say, look, I am a biblical creationist. I am a Christian. I believe in God. There's yeah, no yeah. need for you to misuse science for this reason, okay? okay. And then, once he presents a measurement of a 6,000 year old Earth, I will be happy to let him name it science. But until then, creation science is a lie. Okay. Folks, we are now over time. They're going to shoot us if we don't get out of here. Paul, you're in charge. Can you take another one? Or are we? Last one. Okay. I'm going to say all night. Very quickly, uh, my name is Brad. Uh, I'm Brad. I'm a fan of yours. And the reason is, I had a degenerative incurable disease 25 years ago that I used creation biblical principles are here and follow up that with a doctor out of San Francisco who taught hundreds and hundreds of doctors of emergency medicine. She had terminal breast cancer in 1992. She teaches to groups 10 times as large, 3,000 people every year. And her website is drday.com, Dr. Day. And she used biblical principles to cure her incurable cancer. The pathology test is on the website. She's not, she makes a video that says you can't improve on God. That's the title of her video, and that's what she used to cure her cancer. I suggest you check it out. Okay, now, Paul? Yeah. I will come back. Maybe we need to sweeten the pot. None of the professors would debate, okay? Uh, correct. I'll, I'll, I'll come back. back. A year and a half ago, we invited 146 professors to debate, uh, uh, four, from four different departments to debate Dr. Hoban. Not, not a single one agreed okay. to do that. I will come back, and a, a professor that teaches here at Berkeley, sure. I will pay them $500 okay. to debate me on three simple conditions. 
And that could be 10 of them. Okay, they split up to 500. Uh, <laughs> I get half the time, okay, we talk about one topic at a time, and anybody can videotape it and sell the tapes if they want. Three simple conditions. Thank you so much. We've got to get out of here. Thank you. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoven's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals, like the longevity chart, which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. Drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. Dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. 
Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hoven and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hoven has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new, exciting Dinosaur Adventure Land. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson and captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503, or call us at 850-479-3466, or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.